Yeah, so um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak to you. Uh, I'm Dan McQuillan. I'm a lecturer in creative and social computing at Goldsmiths University of London. And I also recently wrote a book called Resisting AI, an anti-fascist approach to artificial intelligence. And what's the high level thesis of the book? Uh, very much that uh, if we don't pay attention, AI will lead to an increasing amplified series of harms, um, but that there are alternatives. You know, I originally set out to write a book called AI for the People because I want to promote the idea of technology adding social value and making better lives possible. Um, but I ended up calling it resisting AI because the kind of AI we have, I think, needs to be resisted and we need something radically different. Wonderful. I'll just get a shot of the book. Okay, so that's the video. <laughs> that's a great way to start a podcast, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Okay, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and friends, it's with great pleasure and profound anticipation that I introduce you to a remarkable individual, a visionary, and a trailblazer in the realm of digital culture, social innovation, and data science, Dan McQuillan. A man who deftly traverses the realms of experimental particle physics, digital sociology, and creative computing. Dan embodies the essence of intellectual curiosity, interdisciplinary exp uh, exploration, and social impact. Dan said on an interview that he has a brother with Down syndrome, and he's seen at first hand what it's like to be marginalized. In this ever-evolving digital age, where data is king and algorithms shape our lives, Dan champions the critical principles of algorithmic accountability, data-driven equity, and ethical technology. Through his work, he illuminates the importance of understanding the complex interplay between technology and society, and the necessity to balance the potential benefits with the ethical considerations of emerging technologies. As an academic at Goldsmiths University of London, Dan has inspired countless students and colleagues alike through his teaching. He's fostered a new generation of thinkers who can challenge convention and strive to make a meaningful difference in the world. A passionate advocate for interdisciplinary collaboration, Dan recognizes that the most pressing challenges of, of our time demand the collective wisdom of diverse perspectives and areas of expertise. Now, with an illustrious career spanning roles at esteemed organizations like Amnesty International and the Social Innovation Camp, Dan has demonstrated the transformative power of digital tools and data science in addressing some of the world's most pressing issues. His work serves as a testament to the potential of technology to empower, uplift, and ultimately to bring about positive change. So today, we are privileged to engage in a thought-provoking conversation with Dan as we navigate the intricacies of digital culture, social innovation, and the ethical implications of artificial intelligence. We'll explore the myriad challenges and opportunities that lie at the intersection of technology and society and embark on a journey to better understand the profound impact of our digital world. So Dan, welcome to MLST. Thanks very much for having me. Amazing. Um, give us a little bit of a background. Oh, for myself? Yeah. I mean, how did you, because you, you started doing a PhD in experimental particle physics. That's right. Yeah. I even finished a PhD in experimental <laughs> particle physics. So yeah. Um, yeah. But then I, uh, yeah, so that's, that was, um, where I started, but actually I got a little bit disillusioned with it over the time that I was doing it. And uh, immediately after that, I worked with people with learning disabilities and people with mental health problems. And then partly because uh, I was the only one around in the organizations I was in that had anything to do with tech, I drifted into the idea of community technology. And then, you know, the idea that emerging technologies of various kinds could actually, you know, enhance and amplify the kind of social goals that people were working towards and um, spent quite a lot of time in that area, worked for Amnesty for a while, trying to boost the idea of, of digital human rights, essentially. Um, I've worked for the NHS. I've yeah worked in a number of different organizations. Also, Social Innovation Camp was, was something that I started with um, a few friends and colleagues to try to move into a space that where, where nobody was really doing that kind of thing at the time, internationally as well. So, so with Social Innovation Camp, I went to some amazing places like Kazakhstan, Georgia, um, Sarajevo to do these innovation camps, just really trying to trigger people's social imaginations through the possibilities of the tech. 
Um, after one means or another, I drifted back into academia, which is where I am now. Fantastic. Well, um, why don't we talk a little bit, because you, you've just written this very interesting book called Resisting AI. And um, maybe you could just trace a little bit of a path to how you wrote this book and you know what, what are the core arguments in the book? Sure. Um, well, as you could probably tell from the bio, I've always had a bit of a foot in both camps in the sense that I am interested in, well, science and technology, um, but it's also always been important to me you know, what values those things are serving and, and what effects they're bringing about in the world. So working in a computing department, as I do, um, I suppose I was relatively early observer through through my own practice, through what colleagues are doing, of the, the kind of resurgence of data science and then perhaps we could call it the revolution of, a, of recent AI, of deep learning and so forth. So in my mind, that immediately provoked questions of what it was going to do in the world. And uh, I wrote various things about that, touching on various areas, as, as you know, mental health or um, particular social impacts. And I was talking about it at one point when, when um, Bristol University Press said, why don't you write a book? And I did with the original aim of, um, in some way, kind of recapitulating what I'd done before of saying, okay, here's an emerging technological field you know, in what ways could it be brought to do good in a way? So uh, the original working title was something like AI for good or AI for the people. Um, but actually, as I worked through what AI actually does uh, operationally, concretely, computationally, and then also at the same time, simultaneously observing the ways people were tending to use it in the world and really trying to draw the connections between those things, the bring out the resonances between these very specific com computational operations and the kind of um, relationships they were entangled with in the outside world, the institutional effects and the social impacts, I ended up writing a book called Resisting AI. Uh, so Resisting AI is a bit hard to sort of um, sum up briefly, but it, it would start out by trying to demystify what AI is actually mm -hmm. at the moment. The thing we think about as AI, very contested term, of course. Um, and then it moves sort of progressively through um, a series of um, ex uh, a series of increasing levels of likely harm mm -hmm. um, to a point where, you know, I use this term, which is banded about a bit, I suppose, in academia called necropolitics, which we could talk about. So I'm basically going fairly dark on AI. Uh, but that then that's maybe halfway or possibly two thirds of the way through the book. I try to ask what else could be done about it. So I do try to, to um, fulfill that mission in a way by saying, uh, where could we go, you know, as a response to this uh, in ways that would be broadly social, socially beneficial. And I try to be specific about that. So it's a bit of an arc. We'll, Talk a little bit about the language later, mm -hmm. but um, necropolitics, caste real, etc. Mm. Why, why don't we why don't we start with necropolitics? Okay, well, so necropolitics is an idea by uh, a writer, a theorist called Achille Mbembe, who's um, based in Africa, and he was really talking about the post-colonial experiences in Africa, um, particularly of you know so-called post-colonial regimes, this idea that colonialism had somehow gone away and that, um, I guess, people's experiences in these different countries in Africa was therefore uh, somehow radically transformed from what it had been and was also largely under the, you know, control or, or, or direction of people in those places, both of which he kind of like radically disputed by, you know, pointing out that the ruthlessness of um, relations and the experiences that people were subjected to were essentially, um, you know, as brutal as they had been, and that in fact were not really separate from what they had been under colonialism. And he called it necropolitics, I think, because you know that the brutality is is to the point of um, quite stark divisions between who gets what they need in order to survive and thrive, and who is really. Um, either allowed to die or um, 
you know, encouraged, shoved firmly in that direction. And I, and I use necropolitics because I think it's a good way of encapsulating the overall effects of systems that might describe themselves in different ways. They might talk about their missions under various mission statements, various sets of values, but viewing viewing their effects as a whole, um, to me, you know, it seemed to be uh, quite divisive and particularly in our times, uh, one side of that, not start, not not neat division, but one side of that division is people whose life experiences are so sort of reduced or immiserated that they are much more likely to have both short and quite unfulfilling lives. And there, there's another side of that divide. So I think um, it's a term I can use across... Um, technical developments, but also as they relate to institutional uh, impacts or state level action. I mean, I wrote quite a lot of the book during COVID. Mm. So I think you could probably see where that might influence some of the interpretations or some of the readings of what are the underlying dynamics here? And, and more importantly, what's their, what's their direction? What's their directionality? So that's a necropolitics really just means it's not about, um, going around killing people, but it is about the kind of thing that came to the fore through COVID, let's say in this country, where um, people had to ask, why is it that certain parts of our population in a very wealthy country are so much more um, vulnerable to fatal health impacts or, or, or long-term uh, health effects how why is it that some people let's say the population of east london for example are so much more vulnerable than others is it really some identified genetic effect or is it really a cumulative um very long lasting transgenerational result of fairly obvious things of growing up in poor housing with poor nutrition poor life chances so um COVID rev made it, by compressing the time axis, I think, in some way, COVID made it very obvious that these effects underlay, to me, and you know, that would be my understanding of it, that COVID, uh, COVID made it really clear those dynamics underlie a lot of our experiences. So necropolitics is a useful term for me to talk about these kind of systemic effects. You were speaking to there that when Sam Altman at OpenAI, mm. he says that He's doing AI for good. It's going mm. to be a good thing. And then you can disentangle the intention from the consequence. And there were these system, you know, systematic um systemic forces that you were just speaking to. And and of course they are um incentivized to present things in a very positive way. It's PR, mm -mm. it's marketing. Mm -hmm. So um it, it might be quite an interesting time as well just to bring in a very interesting question from Nick on, on our Discord, because when I read Chomsky many years ago, he spoke about, I think he called it neo-imperialism, which is this idea that it's not like the old days where we would go with our guns and take hmm. take people over. Um, it's now markets. So we will install markets in their country and, and we spread the American culture. He called it the kind of hegemonic neo-imperialism. And isn't it interesting to think of machine learning and large language models as being a second order of globalization and, and colonialization? So, um, yeah, Nick said on our Discord community, simultaneously spurring balkanization, uh, we already see consolidation of early leads founded on Western primary English online data. So the implication is join or be left behind. Uh, this collapses our cultural space and prompts competitive digging in from global, uh, global players outside to the joiner sphere. So would, would you think that this, this third order of, of technology is, is the new, you know, colonialization? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the short answer would probably be yes, but I think it's also, um, it, that would be a kind of understanding or a kind of moment of realization, I think, of something that was always already there. That that situation hasn't changed, you know. The the alarm and 
and and and sort of um, vulnerability that a lot of people are now experiencing. I think through large language models, let's say in academia, just to pick a sort of example close to home, where people are suddenly thinking, "Well, maybe I'm disposable. You know, maybe my job's at risk. Uh, and if my job's at risk, what other aspects of my life are going to tumble in, in a domino-like way?" Well, precarity, vulnerability of that kind is, you know, is most people in the world's current experience and has been, I don't know, certainly since the days of empire and colonization. So it's not really that stuff ever went away. Um, but, but on the other hand, it's important to think about, yeah, what are these forms of computation bringing to that? And in what ways are they diverting from it as well? I mean, just to circle back to Sam Altman, uh, I think some of some of it is very crude. You know, it's you know, when you're talking about investment of billions of dollars, you know, that overrides many, many things. Uh, but I think it's useful as well from what you said that the idea of the the good, you know, it's it's good to remember that there isn't really any such thing as the good. You know, there are many, many different kinds of good. And so really talking about, say, technology for good or large language models for good is by itself a meaningless statement and possibly one that's used to conceal other things. In their case, I would say, it, in the sort of their case, in the idea of open AI, particularly by their own, you know, by the, they, they as they state this themselves and quite a few of the other significant players in the AI space as we know it at the moment, because of their commitments to ideas like AGI, artificial general intelligence, um, their idea of good is very skewed towards um, an already defined worldview in which the emergence of AGI is, is inevitable um, and the most significant historical thing that's well, probably ever happened. And so generously, you know, if we're looking beyond market valuation, we'd say their idea of good is very steered by that. And, and I think there's a growing awareness that um, un, you know, under the rubrics of people understanding what does, uh, let's say, long-termism stand for, effective altruism, and I know you've c covered some of these things, you know, on the channel already. People's growing awareness that these visions of the future are well, they're very particular visions, uh, and I would say they also fall into that categorization pretty neatly as well. You know, they're they're hyper-colonial visions in I, I, in my estimation. So. Yeah, there's a lot of it, a lot of coloniality in there. Could could I press you on that <clears throat> a tiny bit? So I also spoke with um, uh, Professor Michael Levin. He's a famous biologist a few weeks ago, and and he was speaking about transhumanism. And again, this is my naivety because I didn't think it was a, a loaded term. Hmm. And it's and transhumanism. You you could argue as being very similar to those other things you just spoke about, um, like effective altruism and so on. And you know. The, the problem is maybe there's a naivety here because when when people speak about things like a quality of opportunity hmm. and the the opportunity to use this clever AI to give yourself an opportunity to be the best version of yourself or to in transhumanists say to use AI to fill in missing capabilities or, hmm. or whatever and on on the other side of the coin it's been linked to things like eugenics hmm. so could you could you e explain the dichotomy there? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, uh, I certainly don't subscribe to the transhumanist view, as you could probably tell. Yes. Um, I would say the idea of enhanced intelligence, um, which AGI is a, an instantiation of, and I think transhumanism as well kind of pivots on, mm -hmm. um, you know, is a very narrow view of intelligence for one thing. Uh, but what it also does is assert, by definition, a more or less linear idea of intelligence, that there's greater intelligence and lesser intelligence, um, rather than just, say, different intelligences. And, uh, of course, there are many layers to that. It's the idea of intelligence is entirely based on sort of cognitive rationality as well, which a lot of other people would say is a very restricted porthole on the world. Um, very disembodied, you know, it's, the, these things are very, they're kind of distillations of some of the problems that other people would call enlightenment thinking, you know, or, or um, humanism, actually. So transhumanism is a kind of a amped up version of humanism. 
But what those definitely do, in my estimation, is um, they can't come without their own binary. If there's uh, enhanced intelligence, there's reduced intelligence. If there's higher intelligence, there's lower intelligence. And there's absolutely a value commitment towards the higher intelligence. You know, Yes, you might say there's an aspiration towards um, spreading this idea of higher intelligence, but that actually is exactly what eugenics was. Eugenics wasn't primarily death camps. Eugenics was, and, and I don't know why I'm saying was, because it's everywhere still. But eugenics is fundamentally this idea of um, optimizing. So we can see where the connection to machine learning might come in, of optimizing mm -hmm. population levels of intelligence, narrowly defined. And with eugenics comes that double move, wanting to enhance and sort of wanting to remove or perhaps eliminate in some sense the the other, the reduced, um, the lesser, the unhelpful, the unproductive, the you know uncreative. I mean, however it is defined in a particular way. So that that's what eugenics is and having worked into the idea of eugenics through exploring what AI as we currently know it is. I, I don't know. At the moment I'm I just can't stop seeing it. It's popping up everywhere. It is but particularly in the narratives around well actually in the narratives around chat GPT or the or large language models. Um Gary Marcus posted a Substack newsletter a couple of weeks ago with the some chilling quotes from Jeffrey Hinton, you know, where he's comparing, he's, uh, he's asserting the innate intelligence of a large language model by comparing, making a direct comparison to something that an adult with a learning disability would say. And I know what he's trying to say. I don't agree with it anyway, because I don't think large language models have a thing that we would call intelligence in them. But I also think because of this question you've asked me about the access of eugenics that's already so problematic as a way of thinking about things and should be challenged immediately otherwise this stuff will just uh, tumble forward yeah there's so many things to pick up on there i mean intelligence is particularly complicated um, because there's the spearman approach mm -hmm. of you know having um a latent factor or there's the gardener approach of thinking as a, as a collection of, of diverse intelligences um but even with something like disability, I mean, I'm 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 building a startup company helping people, you know, with uh, deaf people read conversations when mm -hmm. they can't hear, and and you could argue that that's a form of transhumanism, because I, I guess the the point that you're making is that all of these things lead to increased stratification of society or increased inequality, mm -hmm. because some folks will have the opportunity and other folks won't, and you get these feedback loops where right. things are reinforced and reinforced and the stratification is kind of solidified. Yeah. So that that's the, that's the problem. Sure. I mean, I have a commitment to the idea that the kind of thing you're describing is still possible, you know, that we can mobilize whatever tools to hand to uh, make everyone's experience of society better and to open that up to people. I mean, deaf people, I think historically themselves would have been, you know, I mean, still are in a lot of ways, but would have been radically marginalized and also regarded as uh, of lesser intelligence simply because they were deaf in previous years. So, you know, it's, it's, um, but, but yeah. I, I guess the point I'm making there though, is, is you, you reject the idea that there's a scale of intelligence and more is yeah. better. And similarly, you could make the disability argument that, um, you know, more isn't necessarily better. Maybe it's bad to say that having a disability is 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 a problem, and that needs to be solved. I think my feeling about disability as such is that it's much more useful to think about it in terms of what blocks are we putting in people's ways already. Yeah. Um, you know, you you could say, well, we're, you know, we're helping people into social participation, fine. But actually, you could equally look around and say, well, actually, why were we blocking people from social participation in the first place? 
because we weren't taking their differences into account. I think differences are really pivotal concept in all of this. You know, the the valuing of difference um, and the seeing of difference as kind of difference as constitu const constitutive, it's fundamentally constituting, as fundamentally valuable. Um, so in that sense, I think there's also a, in some things that are intended to be for good, could also have a possibility of sort of trying to homogenize difference back into the world that we're already all used to and accepting of, rather than perhaps challenging our own uh, ways of going about the world or the world the, the worldings that we make, the world that we live in. That seems to have many reasons why it should be questioned. And maybe starting from other people's experiences is exactly the way to question it, rather than just try to yank them up and make them as much like us as possible. Indeed. Okay. One other thing, just but just before we get on to your chat GPT argument, is um, I spoke with Luciano Floridi um, at Oxford. He, he's invented this philosophy of information. And um, he used this wonderful term called reontologizing, mm. which is to say, you know, changing our, our existence. So he said that once uh, once digital immigrants like us are replaced by digital natives like our children, the emigration will become complete and future generations will increasingly feel deprived, excluded, handicapped or poor whenever they are disconnected from the infosphere, like mm -hmm. fish out of water. He's got this idea that um, the infosphere and information is almost the primary lens to understand what goes on in yeah. the world. Right. Um, so he said that information and communication technologies are reontologizing, which is an even more extreme form of re-engineering us and our society, which is to say our intrinsic nature is being transformed. He said that we're modifying our everyday perspective on the ultimate nature of reality, our metaphysics, from a material one, like it used to be in the olden days, in what you know, where physical objects and processes play a key role, to an informational one, and eroding our autonomy and agency as a result. So, what do you think about that information view? Well, there's a lot in there. I mean, I think the reontologizing re thing is great. I mean, I do really think that um, one, it's it's incredibly important to when understanding the impacts of the kind of things that we've got a common interest in ai and um machine learning to understand that the impacts aren't um simply exterior categorizations you know that the the effects of technology always always have shaped our own understandings of ourselves and our own understandings of the world so again you know the whole metaphysics thing i'm completely down with that um you know and and really hunting myself for and possible possible uh, sort of footholds. It's a bit like going to a climbing wall. You know, you're you're looking for for, for ways to to navigate. When um, I think can be a positive thing. The old certainties are clearly um, insufficient, and I'd, I'd agree with that bit as well. I mean, the the information stuff, it, it doesn't do it for me. You know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a materialist, yeah. but but I'm a kind of um, probably I'm really a new materialist, which is. Uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a broad field of thought. Um, it's very influenced by feminism. It's very influenced by science and technology studies. Uh, it's very influenced by this idea that uh, realities are plural, but but not infinitely. You know that um, it's not uh, trying to um, it's certainly not relativism, but it's also not trying to abstract from the material experience or the embodied experience. It's very much trying to sort of embrace those and be situated within them, but understanding that. Uh, perhaps just in a, in every day in every way we're constantly reproducing a reality or reproduce, reproducing realities with each other so i think i'm 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 i just i i'm a, understand i think something of the information approach i think it's actually funny enough quite influenced by physics and uh it's not something that uh well let's say i'm particularly interested in i mean i i have a, my own dodges for these things you know, because we have talked a bit about intelligence and I talk about it in, in, in the book as well, you know, in terms of the entanglement with eugenics. But actually, I'm not that interested in intelligence per se, hmm. artificial or otherwise. I'm not. That's not my primary driver. What I care about is why we don't care more about what's happening to other people in society or perhaps to the planet as well. That seems you know, increasingly pretty important. And what I'm interested in is 
the effects one way or the other that new technologies and technical arrangements of ordering our lives and society, what effects they have on those things. That was my the path I tried to pursue through the book. I'm not engaging in a in a particularly in a debate about the nature of intelligence or whether machines are inter- I don't care mm-hmm. actually. What I'm interested in is uh, our shared experience on this particular planet. Okay. Well, I mean, before we started recording, you said something very interesting, which is that, um, I mean, you're a materialist and there are certain laws in the physical world that we live in. And then we have all of these kind of, I I think you would still use the word emergent realities that can possibly um, derive from those underlying rules. But it's still something which to a certain extent we have the power to create. So rather than discovering one true reality, given the possible traversal space, mm. we, we have some flexibility there to choose the kind of reality that, that we want. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's nicely put. I mean, I do think there are constraints. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I haven't, uh, I wouldn't describe myself as a physicist uh, anymore if I ever was one, but I, you know, I have a lot of, um, I think science is incredibly important in as much as it helps us to understand a um, particular range of those constraints, f- physical, uh, medical, you know, uh, that that's important. I think it's problematic when that simply becomes elevated to the highest truth or perhaps the only form of truth finding or the only form of world making, because I agree with you. You know, there are um, always at every moment uh, the making of worlds is going on and the exploring of the possibilities in that and particularly the exploring of possibilities which actually might uh, reduce suffering, increase well-being, spread plural possibilities for what it is to be alive and what it, what identities could be. These are potentially very open. And in actual fact, the main problem there is that there are various dynamics and forces and interests constantly working to shore up the the sort of flood banks to prevent those different possibilities from emerging. They are already there. They're already uh, more than latent. They're sort of working away. But there's a constant effort uh, to shovel us into a narrow range of identities, to restrict uh, the distribution of goods or the... Um, uh, spread of social status, whatever it is, in very narrow, limited ways that clearly serve narrow interests. So um, life is a very experimental business. You know, we we don't understand it, and that's fine because we're immersed in it. I mean, that's the other way of understanding things. You know, uh, life is a very participatory. The idea that we could stand outside of things, come to some single final understanding of it that allowed us to uh, deduce or infer what it's going to what's going to happen next is um well i'd say it's delusional but it's also like dangerously delusional mm-hmm. I, d- I just wanted to pick apart a couple of things i mean first of all i suppose you would say as chomsky did that it's mostly because of the profit motive markets private enterprise and so on that produces some of these toxic behaviors um, and and what we need is it's a stronger social project but I also wanted you to comment on the difference between reality, as you said, and meaning. Mm. Because some folks, for example, um, I mean, even Jordan Peterson, he, he's a narrativist. And he thinks that we use stories to construct meaning about the world. And I just wondered, when, when, you, when you talk about this kind of social reality, do you mean meaning or do you mean reality? Well, I think... Um... One of the important navigational tools to have for all of us, I think, is an understanding of um, how to move with both meaning and material. Um, They are labels that we put on um, our experiences, our physical experiences, our emotional experiences, um, the experiences of our imagination. Those are labels that we put on things. Um, One constant with that kind of labeling is it almost always has an a priori division between those things. And I think that's kind of um, pragmatic. 
you know, I do experience myself as having internal experience and I imagine for myself that you have that and all the evidence to me suggests that and with everybody else as well. Uh, and yet there are, and we have shared material realities. This table isn't going anywhere. Um, but I also think is it's that in itself is the interesting point. You know, at what points in our understandings, at what points in our agreements about shared reality, do those divisions get made? And what are, what are the flexibilities in them? I think that's undetermined. Because it's quite interesting, is um, uh, Nick on our Discord community? He was flicking through your paper, Data Sciences, uh, Machinic Neoplatonism, mm -hmm. which I think is quite cool to bring in here. But you you said in that paper that while machine learning and data science may sometimes be criticised for their reductionist approach, we'll talk about that to understand complex phenomena, it's often that the true goal of these fields is often to identify a deeper patterns and relationships within large and complex data sets. In this sense, there's a parallel with the Neoplatonic emphasis on seeking a deeper understanding of reality and the underlying principles that govern it. In contrast, the Neoplatonic approach emphasizes contemplation and introspection, let's put mm -hmm. an anchor on that, um, as a means of gaining insight into the underlying principles that govern reality. And whilst this approach may be less immediately applicable to the task of undercovering um, patterns within complex data sets, it may offer a different kind of insight and perspective on the nature of reality and, and our place in it. Now, um, one thing we'll explore a little bit is, is, is the difference between humans and machines because the... Con That's Google Home. Huh. Yeah, and Google wants to get involved in the interview. Did you say a trigger word or something? I, I, I must have done this. The yeah. AI doesn't work. AI doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we when we when we um, use language, it's quite often it's anthropomorphic, so contemplation, introspection, because mm -hmm. uh, presumably you would think transformers models, for example, these language models, they're not doing introspection, right? But maybe they are, right? They, they've they've got multiple levels of information passing back and back and back, and is is it really so different? Well, people have a different take on that, you know. I, uh... As I, as I was kind of alluding to in a way, you know, that there are different understandings of cognition, thought, consciousness, which I think is vital. I mean, ask because it does serve as a very handy indicator towards some of the limitations of sort of positivist scientific knowledge. That there isn't really any half convincing uh, formulation of consciousness within that particular framework at the moment. Now, those ideas about thought might be very valid. Those thoughts about thought might be very valid. Um, it's not particularly my concern. You know, my concern is not to understand thinking. It's to think about why the things in the world are happening the way they are, what um, these machines will intensify, and how that could be done differently. Um, I, I don't... I do think that um, there's some really good efforts around things like, well, particularly around things like an activism, actually, mm. to to explore the different possibilities of my understanding of that, like really crudely, would be, you know, trying to bring together, let's say, a scientific viewpoint and a phenomenological one. And that seems like a really valuable sort of um, seam to tr try to mine. But uh, that's a very worthy a necessary thing and i think it's important to have a non-restrictive idea about the division between meaning and material but for my concern it's not necessary to have come to a conclusion on that pathway before recognizing that some of the things we're doing are just really very clearly harmful to other beings in whatever way you consider them to have an existence and um well yeah Interesting. Um, I'm I'm a fan of an activism as well. Although I must say, from this conversation, I mean, j just for folks in the audience, an activism is is a it's it's a really a relatively recent idea in cognitive science in the last twenty years, where you decompose cognition, focusing on actions through affordances, and affordances is basically just the the interface between the inside and and the outside of a thing. So the affordances, mm -hmm. I can pick up this can of coke, I can act. And then you can take trajectories of actions through some space. But the the problem with the inactivist approach, in, in my opinion, because it, it also 
uses the world as its own best representation. So it's it's a step away from representationalism. And it's actually um, an acknowledgement that we can't model subjective experience. Mm. So it's almost saying, let's focus on what's outside the system rather than the internal mental states. And, and that that's basically behaviorism 2.0. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, 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 you know, like I, it's not, uh, I'm not wanting to sort of clump, trump over people's feet who are very well immersed in that area. My understanding would be there are different ways of enacting inactivism. Yes. Um, the the vari variants you describe, which I'd say are the more predominant ones because they fit more closely and easily with science, um, do have exactly have that kind of flattening effect. Hmm. I don't think they're the only ones. I think the, 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 the more, um, radically phenomenologically oriented ones you know because they they themselves become marginal within an activism but it's so it's not that these these issues aren't recognized and i meant to say by the way it's like uh just to pick up on the jordan peterson thing yes you know yes. That maybe you know you bring me here you sit me down and you compare me to jordan peterson i don't know <laughs> i mean this could be my point to storm out of the interview um what, what popped into my mind then, actually, was the idea of, uh, you talked about second order or th even third order right at the beginning. I think Donna Haraway has a really v uh, valuable little contribution, not little, but in the sense of it's a short contribution within one of her texts, where she says, you know, it's important the stories that we tell stories with. Mm -hmm. It's important that the thoughts that we think thoughts with. She's trying to to, to again, to make that sort of second order move and... I would say someone like Jordan Peterson is drawing on a very particular form of storifying things. I mean, I, I'm not really interested in exploring his ideas of meaning versus materiality. Just to say the stories that he's drawing on themselves are um, have very particular uh, social payloads and also have very particular historical resonances. And they are not the only stories that could be drawn from and, and, and sort of um, uh, perhaps a demonstrator of the danger of uh, restricting, you know, your ideas of storifying reality to certain particular narrow mythic frameworks. But yes, we don't want to go on down that rabbit hole, maybe. Well, I mean, maybe just another 30 seconds down the rabbit hole, because yeah. uh, I, I recently watched a video on Philosophy Tube about it, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the details, but apparently he, he, his um, brand of philosophy is phenomenology, so it's how you feel. Mm this narrativism thing influencing from structuralism and uh and i think um uh, abigail thorne on on philosophy tube you know she said well it's, it's not bad he just stopped reading at 1950 or something and he should have just kept right. reading because maybe you could just quickly contrast that to some of the ideas i think which have influenced you in in postmodernism and, mm. and post-structuralism but but also i think and, and you know you can you can poke me as much as you like about this because i don't think you you can completely distinguish the ideas from the person. It's not that ideas are entirely reducible to biography. It's not I'm saying, oh, he only thinks that because of X, Y, Z, or um, Sam, Alt Sam Altman is only saying these things because um, his company is raking in loads of money from it. It's not reducible in that way, but it is also a bit like this material meaning thing. It's not separable. Hmm. And I think you can. it doesn't take too much for me to be able to step back from someone like Peterson and the many, many others there are at the moment, and that's part of the problem, there are many, many others in that ilk, and see that with your other ear, that this is absolutely a defense of white male privilege and, um, you know, and white supremacy. That's how it's being deployed. And if that is perhaps a um, valid philosophical framework, well, then that valid ph philosophical framework needs some other philosophical frameworks because by itself... It has a clear social payload. And, you know, I adopt ideas, let's say, post-structuralist or whatever. They are also not somehow come from the realm of pure thought. I mean, they were born f from people who experienced the events of 1968 hmm. and sought to understand all aspects of those events, sought to understand the essentially insurrectionary energies and the um, wonderful new possibilities that people seem to perceive, but also the way those events seem to sabotage themselves and seem to, in some ways, end up maybe even strengthening the thing they were fighting against. Yes. So, um, you know, uh, we had a chat earlier on before we started recording about, you know, 
perhaps you might call it positionality or what I call it standpoint or situated knowledge is that, you know, we are, we are all approaching the, our understandings of the world from a certain place. I am here right now in, in this embodied being. And I do uh, find it hugely valuable to learn from other thinkers and their thoughts about the world. But at the end of the day, my position will be filtered through my life experiences, my aspirations, and so are these other thinkers. To ignore that and to say, well, um, okay, someone like Jordan Peterson has a you know, very thoughtful and valid philosophy, so it must be okay that the world is arranged in this way, I totally dispute. Yes, it's so interesting because we were speaking about this concept of um, relationism and also relativism before, before we started um, recording. And Floridi said the same thing. He said that um, even if you're a philosopher, there needs to be a purpose. There, there's, mm. there's a question, there's an answer, there's a purpose. You need mm. to understand everything in, in, in relation. But then there's the question of in what relation, mm. right? Because um, I think Peterson even wrote a book called Maps of Meaning, where presumably he spoke about all of this stuff. Mm. And that's a relational framework to Because it's almost like in order to know or understand something, mm. there needs to be a relational framework. Mm. But which is the correct relational framework? I mean, just to give sure. an example, you, yeah. you, you just use the term white supremacist. And that's something which, because I don't have the framework to understand that, that seems... And I mean, to be honest, it, it, it's something that makes me a little bit uncomfortable because it, when it's used, oh, um, that person is saying some, it, that person is part of the white supremacist meta narrative or something like sure. that. That, it, that. That feels like I'm being essentialized in, sure. in a way. So, um, so, so which is the right framework to use? How do we know? Yeah, well, you know, the snappy, smart ass answer would be to say that the asking that there's a single right framework is itself. A problem, right? No, no. But yes. I mean, you know, yeah. th 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 there clearly isn't one right framework. But I totally, um, I, I would like to respond to what you're saying about the kind of essentializing thing because, actually, a minute ago when we were chatting about stuff, I did remember, you know, that an important aspect for me of this is is what you might call psychopolitical in the sense that um, what's present in all these things, what's present in our our interaction, what's present in our social structures. And what's present in the conception of what technologies can be and do um, are not just conscious, uh, but unconscious, hmm. um, psychodynamic uh, energies and effects and, and uh, lineages and connections. And I guess I've got to a stage now where, because it's been kind of... Um, rightly brought to my attention in enough places in enough different ways, you know, that I, I'm okay now. I, I can understand actually that I am hugely privileged, you know, that I do have incredible advantages compared to some people's experience of life, actually, basically because of being a middle-class white male with a good education. I mean, that is, um, you know, l that's literally money in the bank, but it's more than that. It's social capital that has, um, preserved me and extended me in ways that other people simply don't have a chance to have. Now, that doesn't mean I'm a bad person. That's just where I have the things I happen to be born into in some extent and experience in other ways and, and be gifted in other ways. Um, it's not, that's, I don't think that's a condemnation of me unless perhaps I refuse to recognize it or unless perhaps I didn't then think about what am I going to do with this? Hmm. So I, I just think it, Firstly, that it's not, I don't think these things should be read as a condemnation of any individual or, or even, or, or social group as such. But it does lead into your other question, you know, what's the right thing to do, if you like? And that's a, you know, very long question, has a huge lineage, you know. Um, I, I'm not trying to, for myself, work from or through any of the things that I write, a single version of that. I'm not trying to impose um, a particular communist vision of the world or a particular set of relationalities. But my idea of relational thinking and understanding, um, definitely not involved, in, in, informed by Jordan Peterson, would be much more informed by feminism, who I think of feminist thinking, uh, from the same kind of period, actually, from back in the 60s onwards, has had this understanding of uh, how to you know, read life and understand society as primarily relational um, with consequences. What are the consequences of that? And the consequences are not just that there are relations, but um, 
as, as you all know, because you've had, had read the book, you've had looked through the book, you know, the idea of care mm. is, is kind of important in the second half of the book. And that arises out of this feminist idea of relationality in the sense of, uh, you know, as a simple rule of thumb, as a heuristic to understand, you know, when I go into college and uh, it's, you know, let's say it's the first lecture of the day and it's the early morning shift and all the cleaners coming out of are coming out of college and they're you know with their massive sets of keys or whatever and they're all black women and i'm a white man walking in there to do the lecture that is a very particular kind of relationality that's a very very particular set of um a very asymmetric power relation mm -hmm. and those people's experiences are very strongly affected by their situatedness so what happens i mean goldsmiths i think has been people at goldsmiths the staff at goldsmiths have had a long struggle to bring workers like that as they say back in house to make sure that they do have some at least decent minimal terms and conditions they're not you know instantly dismissible because they're just some poor paid contract worker but they at least have some proper relationship with work that they have some proper remuneration that they have sick pay and all that kind of thing I'm not trying to portray that's to me is um it's not equalizing but some element of equitability you know if if you see others who need care in some way who are suffering in some way why are you not motivated to do something about that would is the question i ask myself mm. um <laughs> could could you just quickly could you just quickly speak to because you spoke about I think the the second wave of of feminism and and you were just getting on to the social care and emancipation and so on but um but now I, I think we we are in the the regime of intersectional feminism mm. just to explain the the difference a little bit to, to the audience and how it's evolved well I think inter intersectionality is a good is a good uh, starting point for the kind of social thinking that I try to do alongside the thinking about the machines the thinking about the technology. I mean, intersectionality um, as a political concept would probably be say, uh, looking at these different ways of um, assessing asymmetries in society, the sort of topographies of inequality and uh, radically different experience. So those might be, we probably typically say class, gender, race, mm -hmm. let's say. Intersectionality would be, and it's been articulated by particular thinkers, you know, in, in recent history, would be to say um, is is to assert the inseparability of those things in some way, you know, rather than the primacy. I mean, the primacy problem might have come from well, from different dimensions, but it might be that, uh, you know, like I say, it might be if there was a form of feminism that was asserting that the gender divide was the primary problem, or the class divide is the primary, problem, or, the, or the race race inequalities are primary problem but they're yeah. entangled yeah they're saying entangled and entangled is you know i think entangled you know that term is really much more helpful tool to look at those experiences that sociality and also the uh, impacts of technology interesting and um the traditional left was focused on social class in particular Mm. And and now we're speaking about this entanglement between different identities like um, sex and sexuality and, and and race and so on. Um, I just wondered how how did how did that come about and how how has it um, mm. affected the, the the left viewpoint? Well, speaking as a pers spokesperson for the left viewpoint, um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, no, because well, anyway, also I'd say that's a bit of a story, actually. You know, right that um yeah there was an attempt to sort of um establish that as a dominant framework on let's say progressive thinking or whatever you might want to call it at a certain point in time but history is 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 such an interesting you know patch of earth to dig in because it always turns out that things are always more complicated and the people's ideas of what liberation might be were always i mean intersectionality is a kind of minimal you know, there are many times, many different ways, people have always thought of this in a much more pluralistic sense, hmm. which is great, you know, because it, that 
is clearly, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's uh, clearly much more helpful because that our experiences of, of life are are shaped by so many different forces, and sometimes they are very forceful forces. And to it's it's impossible, I think, to simply pick on one and say this is a. I mean, f for particular people, one might be the most dominant one, but they're certainly not the only one for anybody. And the entanglement of um, the unfolding of history, and also very particularly the unfolding of history alongside those things we tend to think of as technology, um, machines or uh, mechanical mechanisms, you know, those those entanglements are always plural alongst all of those lines. So um, it isn't only like, a, it's, it's, it's a matter of left history, but it's also a matter of, let's say, considering... Um, politics in that way you know that if, if that is in, in a sense some kind of politics then actually the thing I'm most interested in is trying to think about techno politics trying to think about those things inseparably you know what is it about particular ways of ordering society okay through largely through production but also through social reproduction with various kinds of machines and technologies and infrastructures that constantly sort of layer over the top of each other you know the way fiber optic cables you know recapitulate those patterns of uh, telegraph lines mm. across the atlantic and you know i mean that's a very physical instantiation but they the both on the material and the semantic sense these these structures of machines they lay on top of each other you know in what ways do these shape these other really important experiences of life these intersectional relations um and, and how that pans out for each and every one of us. Yeah, that makes sense. So the way the way I understand it, because I can use an analogy in machine learning, some people think that we should design a structure, a lens, and some people say, oh, it's just too complicated. You must let it emerge a bit. But in a way, you're, you're talking to, there is a, a structure in society and it's entangled in a very complicated way. And that relational topology kind of defines the world that we live in mm. you know, the, 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 our reality to a certain extent so there's a real focus to shine a light on that structure yeah i think i think it's in both to see what it's doing at the moment and also to see what else it could be doing yes okay okay let's move on to your article about chat gpt now this was a very very interesting article um emily bender retweeted it which is how i how i discovered you but um it was called We Come to Bury ChatGPT, not to praise it. So um, summarizing a little bit, you said ChatGPT is a bullshit generator that produces baseless assertions with unfailing confidence. And the more optimized ChatGPT becomes, the more harmful it is as it hallucinates um, even more and they become harder to spot. Um, reinforcement learning from human feedback only makes it better for, um, you know, better at bullshitting, basically, not a not a... Um, a reliable AI. The concept of AGI, you said, is inseparable from the hierarchy of intelligence that has underpinned ideas of innate supremacy, which we just spoke to a bit. Um, you said that contemporary AI is an assemblage for automating administrative violence and amplifying austerity. And AI realism is a form of hopelessness that accepts AI's potential harms without questioning its speculative benefits. And also the structural injustices and supremacist perspectives layered into AI put it on the path of eugenicist solutions to social problems, which again, we spoke to a little bit. And finally, you said that um, AI technologies in, in prison our ability to imagine real alternatives and we should focus on socially useful production instead. So um, let's start with the bullshit generator thing. Um, you know, why are we so easily fooled by its smooth talking? Hmm. So, so you're saying that article is a bit of a rant? <laughs> Would no, I? Fine. Would I say yeah, that? Exactly. Would I say that? It, it was a good rant. Yeah. I, I enjoyed reading it very much. I'm, I'm glad I got it out of my system. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So that's a really great question. Why? Why are we so susceptible to bullshit? Um, I mean, just to, just to explain myself, you know, I'm saying it's bullshit because it's... Uh, I suppose a combination of two things. It is, to me, literally meaningless. The output of that machinery is literally meaningless. Could you explain why? Yeah, be because it's the product of 
uh, machine calculation, you know, statistical uh, statistical reproduction of patterns learned through the ingestion of lots of text. And it's producing tokens in an order that is uh, statistically, you know, through through quite complicated models like transform model, you know, but it's essentially a statistical pattern learning machine that does a lot, of, lot more convincing job of producing patterns. But that's the point. The convincing is at our end, not at the machine end. The machine is simply carrying out optimizable calculations to produce tokens and is... Uh, that that process is optimized mathematically. It produces these tokens in ways that come across to us as having meaning, or possibly even convincing and possibly even insightful. That's us doing that. Um, kind of that's us looking in a mirror darkly in a way and and becoming amazed by our own insights uh, rehashed back to us in some way. But also, you know, there is something really disingenuous about these particular models, open AI again, you know, they are that the tonality of those things is not accidental. You know, it is, it is trying to sound mostly authoritative or even by sometimes apologizing and correcting itself, trying to sound perhaps more than authoritative, but like, you know, it's something you can trust because it's admitting to some extent, some fallibility. Yeah, that, that's something I have a particular problem with chat GPT. It uses um, emoticons mm. and, um, you know, like smiley faces and, and apologies. So so that that increases the risk of um, anthropomorphization. But mm. I, I did want to just tease apart a little bit, though, that because you were kind of saying it doesn't understand. Mm. And I don't know whether it's because you think that no machine could understand or do you think there is a spectrum of understanding? I mean, it, is it possible to have a slightly lower fidelity understanding, but still an understanding nonetheless? To me, it doesn't. There's no understanding in there. To me, it's, you know, it's a music box. So what what's your definition of understanding? Um, I wouldn't have a pat one. Okay. I mean, I would say for me, meaning is, uh, comes out of those relations we were talking about earlier on. Um, with, um, well, with beings, uh, also with the natural world, um, and the material world. It's not that I think, um, these machines themselves have no meaning. Clearly they have huge, uh, sets of meanings, but I find it, I don't find it plausible that there's any use of the things you brought up earlier on in sort of introspection or contemplation um, of a kind that I would understand, that I would empathize with, that I could relate to. You know, perhaps there are ways of philosophically describing what's going on in those machines in a way that can situate them as, you know, cognition in some way, and that's fine. You do that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't lit literally care. I'm interested in what this particular machine constructed in this particular way is clearly already doing in the world. And that is, uh, in my opinion, falsely persuading people that it has some level of insight, minimal or maximal, into any particular situation. And, and there's more to it than that. It's not even that people believe that, it, that a large language model necessarily understands those things. They think it's kind of a, a good enough start to understand those things. And I'm quite concerned about what's already lost in that good enough start. You know, there, there's a lot of that in the space, I, the, the fishbowl, I'm in for education. You're going, oh, well, you know, you need to embrace chat GPT. And of course, it's not perfect. And it gets things wrong and um, misunderstands, you know, <laughs> assuming that it understands anything. But, you know, that's something we can work with. We can use that with students and, you know, make it a you know, make it the start of exercises. And we, well, it's a great way to teach critical thinking is to, you know, that that's a second order move. It's like, yeah, okay, this machine uh, produces some complete fabrications. That's a great provocation to, you know, critical thinking. And um, I, my personal feeling is if you start that way, you've already lost. And uh, so, yeah, so I don't attribute any, I personally don't attribute any thought process to it. You can, that's fine. Uh, but let's look at the consequences of doing that. And the consequences of doing that, um, what, I, what I kind of 
tried to inject into the short piece you describe also was um, related to some other reading I've been doing recently of something much different, which is European Union policies and frameworks for AI, you know, which is a pretty big thing in a way, because that we're talking there about um, huge institutional commitments, huge investment, uh, mm. a shaping, you know, we were talking, you've talked and we've, we've both talked quite a lot about um, the shaping of our worlds. I mean, whatever we think of the EU and, you know, allegedly we're sort of somewhat outside it right here, right now, which is a bit implausible. The effects of it will definitely be felt. And the primary principle, well, my reading of those long and extremely tedious, and I'd say deliberately tedious documents, is first off, the EU is 100% committed to do it to AI. The future of, they see the future of the EU. Mm -hmm. Through AI, two reasons. Uh, economic, obviously, and um, because that's the kind of extent of understanding, and also geopolitically. You know, I think you, something you said earlier on reminded me of that. I mean, these things are, you know, these are the geopolitics of our time as well. So, you know, the European Union, so well, China over there, USA over there, we're Europe, we want to be a thing. We want to be doing so. so they're totally bought into it. But the point of this long preamble is that their skeleton key for all this is trustable AI. Hmm. Okay. Being the EU, they're taking on, you know, the fact that this isn't always an untrammeled good thing, that there may be some drawbacks and... Uh, you know, some downsides and biases, whatever. So they're very concerned that we should... Well, they, they, what they say they're concerned about is producing trustable AI. What they're really concerned about, and it's pretty transparent, is that we just trust AI. Yes. Right? Because actually they haven't got any other way of getting trustable AI other than the AI we've got. And they're in a great hurry to get on with it. So I'm putting those two things alongside each other because I'm saying, okay, well, we might have a different idea about cognition. We might have a different idea about what these things are doing. But let's look at the work they're doing in the world. And when you start to buy in that these things are producing some kind of insight and some kind of truth, then, well, as I, uh, that was the connection I was trying to make in the article, you're, you're shortcutting to what the EU is already trying to get to. Hmm. These things can be trusted. You're also opening up a huge range of other areas, like something that has come up a little bit in our, you know, our, our brief exchanges before talking today is, you know, some of the impacts on and through mental health. If you ascribe some kind of insight to these machines, then it's actually would be ridiculous not to apply them in therapeutic and diagnostic settings, which again is another area for me, and I, th I suspect we're about to discuss it a bit, you know, is would be extremely dangerous. I mean, first of all, um, the AI we have now is, is not robust. It's trained on the conspiracy laden mm. internet. Um, but it is fine tuned with RLHF and mm. you were speaking to the students. And unfortunately, a lot of the mistakes are under the radar because it mm. produces plausible text. And when you use these things for an extended period of time, um, it dawns on you after a while. I, th I think there's th when you first use GPT-4, it, it is genuinely amazing, I have mm. to say. But but um, you have the halo effect, and then over time, you start to notice these errors, and it dawns on you that you've mm. missed lots of other ones before. Um, but um, yeah, so it's it's not it's not reliable. At all, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I love the I love the academic citations thing because it's quite good at generating really plausible sounding papers with real authors, you know, who genuinely yes. work in that particular area. Yes, it's only that that particular paper doesn't exist. Or the classic one in our case, talking to the students and colleagues in computing, is the well, I mean, I say hilarious, but I think it hasn't always been a good experience, where in some cases smaller companies uh, are, you know, are getting hammered. You know, uh, their API is getting hammered because GPT has told somebody that this their API does this thing it doesn't do, and there's all these people putting this question into to to to, to um, GPT three or four or whatever it is, and they're getting told, yeah, this is the answer to your, you know, this is the tech, you, this is the code you need. It uses this API which doesn't exist. But that, I, mean, I, I can really relate to that argument. Yeah. So I, I think it it is polluting the infosphere mm. um, dramatically. But the, the thing I want to tease apart is we're speaking about the AI as if it exists on its own. And mm. if anything, I want to bring in this entangled idea that we had before, which is that humans use AI. And yeah, maybe they'll have a bit of critical thinking. I, I, I don't know. But, but don't, don't we have to 
actually think because it's 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 not really artificial intelligence. Yes, it's neither artificial nor intelligence. Yes. Um, according to um, what was that lady's name? She wrote the um, the Atlas. Kate book. Crawford. Anyway. Kate Crawford. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, why don't we just think of it as a tool enmeshed and and embedded in society? Would that be a different lens? Yeah, it definitely would, and then a much better one, much more important one, but you know, one that then I think actually forefronts the problematics, not like a closing door. You know, it's yeah. not like I'm saying, oh yeah, we should definitely get rid of all technology beyond um, pulleys and levers or something like that, necessarily. But um, you know, it is it is the right situation because it, uh, I think, the way you describe it encompasses the bit that we really most often ignore, which is where did this stuff come from in the first place? You know, so much of the narrative around, um, you know, deep learning or machine learning models or whatever it is, um, really seem to have an imaginary where this stuff is created somewhat outside of society, whether it's in the hallowed halls of Microsoft Research or wherever else it is, or academia, you know, by incredibly bright people who understand maths and computing, um, you know, while those while the values of those people and their motives might be questioned, it's as if this thing is created in within a sphere of its own, and it needs to be ported across into society. And we need to be careful about how we do that because it might we might tip balances some in some way, and we might create biases and discriminations, and, and maybe it does have some other downsides that we haven't even thought of. Um, but I don't know what people think about it like that, but they talk about it like that, and that completely misses. The point that's very, very, not even latent, but explicitly in your description, which is these do, these don't come from somewhere else. Mm. These technologies were developed within the society that we all know. We are all experts in experience of this society, of whichever society it is that we live in. Right? We're already the experts because we live in it. And these technologies, however complicated they are, and they are complicated, and actually, you know, I can look at these things as much as I can understand them and go, do you know what? That's pretty clever. That is a nice trick. That's a nice piece of, I think of it as like technical jujitsu. You know, that's, I, I can appreciate that. You know, I have a, that background in science and background in, in sort of an analytical perspective on the world. And, you know, I, 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 can, I can dig it. But the idea, the most important thing to remember is really that it, it emerges out of the same matrix that it's going straight back into. The feedback loops don't start then. They already, they come at, at its very inception, it's shaping. So, you know, the idea that we could ever unentangle these things is, is, uh, is, is patently absurd. And I think it's, that's why I, I, at the moment, what I'm working on really is trying to define for myself a more useful concept of this idea of technopolitics, meaning that, um, because I'm interested in, in, in the political small p aspect of it, you know, that these are highly impactful on, uh, say, power relations, production distribution, that meaning of political, and that the kinds of technologies, that the techno part of that is inseparable from that, shapes that and is shaped by it. And you could say that, you know, people who understood that, for example, with the Luddites, you know, they had a they had, they had a grasp on the idea that these things that were being introduced as new forms of productivity were in fact world changing for them yes. in their immediate sense. But you wouldn't describe yourself as a luddite. Well, I probably would. Yeah. Oh, you would. Okay, yeah. right. I probably would. Yes. Yeah. Or I don't know, a neo luddite. Yeah, I think luddite is good. Interesting, but the the reason I ask that question is, um, you're still a technologist. You love computers. Yeah. So how do you square that that kind of tussle? Yeah, I square that because I'm not buying into the idea of, of Luddite that, you know, again, that historical story, you know, which, come on, I mean, it is largely pivoted on, you know, these people didn't get the necessity of technology. You know, they were kind of, they were primitivists in some way. Hmm. They were backward looking, regressive, you know. I mean, there's so much to read in, in that. You know, the idea that... Um, Increased productivity means progress, necessarily, um, or untrammeled productivity means progress. Um, in any case, whichever dimension you take on it, it's a total misunderstanding. I think you know we could say 
on the best historical evidence of what the Luddites were really about. You know, the Luddites used machines themselves. They, they went against technology. What they what they were questioning in my in my opinion were the radical alterations in in the social relations that were coming about as a result of these particular kind of machines and their particular arrangements of ownership and control. Interesting, but you you have said that you think AI is a scam. Did I and say that? You did on on a, on a YouTube interview. Then I said it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I can fit the reference in, but yeah. yeah. But um, but the the, the con like a bit of context because um, a question came up in that YouTube interview, hmm. and the gentleman asked, "Could you imagine a society where AI could possibly be good?" Hmm. And you said, um, "To be honest, if we lived in a good society, the." the phenomenon of AI couldn't emerge or wouldn't emerge or something along those lines. So I find that a little bit difficult to get my head around because I still have this mindset of, I can imagine a world where AI could be beneficial. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong. I'm just trying to express my own, uh, reading of the current moment. Um, I, would very much like it if we stepped back from uh, actually multiple of the technologies that we currently have, including AI, and, and, and like quite a long way back um, because of the assumptions that are, not just the assumptions, but the modes of production that are actually already enrolled in these things. You know, the let's look at something you mentioned a minute ago about um, RLHF. I've got it right, haven't I? Reinforcement learning with human yes, feedback. Yes. Yeah, I always get that wrong. Uh, in my head. I think what, for example, what that suggests to me is that um, our understanding of machine learning is already very skewed because there is, thankfully, you know, as they say, a lot of critical scholarship about this kind of stuff. And more than that, there's, there's an awareness amongst uh, at least, let's say, activist communities or amongst um, workers themselves that, there's a heck of a lot of invisible labor goes into these things. Now, um, I think language models are a really interesting example because they're self-supervised learning at the primarily, you know, which was always the thing I remember only a few years ago, you know, people were saying oh, that that's the, that's some kind of grail, you know, and that will allow us to move past this uh, awkward reliance on, you know, extremely underpaid and exploited crowdsourced yes. labor, right? Pendulum so, swung the other way. Yeah, well, it, well, and, you know, and it, what I think, what I'd read from that, you know, is uh, some kind of law of AI, actually, that uh, here's, a, here's a prediction from somebody who complains about predictions, that it will turn out that no form of AI as we can currently conceive it um, will be operational without somewhere at some point, and probably at several points, a massive injection of devalued human labor and that's my kind of beef with it as well you know that mm. bigging up the computational operations and the models and the engineering and everything else is entirely ignoring who's making this stuff actually work and that comes in at many levels okay it comes in at the poor people who had to go through the you know um bestiality and child abuse content and remove it from yeah uh, you know gpt models that's one variant of it but I think, you know, as you look around, you see many different examples that when for uh, when applications you sort of find hard to argue with, you know, the ones that have been happening with the NHS, of, well, we, we, you know, we've got a, a model here that will allow the early prediction of kidney problems mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, as it turns out, when these systems are introduced into real world settings, let's say out of the lab, uh, you know, life is just a lot more complicated and messy and so are people and basically so is everything else. I mean, even material reality is much more complicated and messy and it always needs um, a huge amount of sort of compensatory human work and uh, care actually to uh, keep the thing afloat. And weirdly, I'm, I'm, I'm working myself up here a little bit, but uh, I think I do get kind of quite narked by the idea that... Um, what seems to be happening is that we're having to spend a lot of time caring for the technology 
which is supposedly providing the answer to our problems of care, when mm. actually we could probably short, short circuit that by actually just caring for each other in the first place a bit more effectively. So, so yeah, I do think, you know, and we can explore the different aspects. I do think there are many aspects of the dynamics of currently understood, definitely deep learning and all its associated methodologies, transform models or reinforcement learning, whatever. And even machine learning to a large extent that are sufficiently problematic in terms of their effects in the world, that it would be a good idea to step back from them. Not to say that the people involved in it have always been trying to, to do bad things by a long chalk. That's not the case. And um, I think people with technologi technological uh, or technical skills, mathematical skills and scientific skills and understandings, um, you know, again, the, our, our well-being is entangled with that. You know, we're not we're not going to have a good world without those kind of skills. But, uh, you know, we, we can look at the general direction of travel of of societies in general and say, um, you know, those things look like they need reorienting pretty majorly, um, f for because of the social impacts and also because of the planetary impacts. You, you said something interesting, which is that it's becoming increasingly clear how exploitative this technology is. Mm. And part of the reason for that is the increased necessity for humans to do the fine tuning on, on the model. Mm. And there was that story you referred to with OpenAI um, using that company called Sammer in, in Africa. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But um, it's it, one interesting trend I've seen is that open AI, it's not open anymore. It's become mm. increasingly closed off, but, but actually you could argue it's the competitive landscape, but you could also argue that it's becoming increasingly clear to everyone how exploitative the technology is. Mm. And, um, a few years ago when GPT three came out, everyone thought, oh, this is amazing. Mm. They've just taken the common cruel corpus, um, and it, it's a reasonably well-known data set and they've just trained it and oh, we've got an AI mm. and over time, presumably they've had to outsource lots of different types of data. We yeah. don't know where from, they yes. won't tell us yes. and they'll do all of this reinforcement, uh, learning preference tuning. We don't know. They don't tell us anything about it mm. and it's becoming completely obscure. And you probably read that ethics washing piece from Altman the other day, talking all about how they're going to align the models and how they're such wonderful people. Uh, I mean, what did you think about that? Um, yeah, I think the word align itself is very revealing, isn't it? And you know, you know, obviously from even from the previous conversations you've had, and uh, that the word alignment is itself a kind of keyword that that alignment is used often to indicate it's almost a kind of um it's almost a kind of gang sign you know it's like yeah we're, we're down with the agi crew here you know we see the future benefits of these things um as sort of uh sufficiently you know at sort of um beyond planetary scale you know so yeah they're reading they're re he's, he's reading a kind of uh large language models for good bedtime story but it's also really distilled through this perspective on what a you know almost kind of what the inevitable planetary situation must be, and uh, that those assumptions in themselves we talk you know we we, we kind of name check the long termist view you know the spacefaring super race of virtual beings type view of reality now whatever you know I'm quite into science fiction as well you know you won't be surprised to hear yeah I mean know. the Bostrom stuff. Yeah, well, the, the, yeah. you know, it's 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 fine as a, as a kind of science fiction story in in a way, but well, they take it incredibly seriously. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's interesting to me that the well, interesting might not be quite the right word. Chilling, perhaps, is a good word. <laughs> that the uh, you know that these concepts of a necessity for uh let's say radical risk reduction you know and this concept of risk you know seems to chime so well again with um historical parallels i mean recent historical parallels in this case there was a guy called hardin i've forgotten his first name for the moment he was the one who came who wrote the 
very influential paper on the idea of the tragedy of the commons. Yes. Garrett Hardin. Uh, he was also a guy who wrote quite uh, extensively on this idea of lifeboat ethics. Mm. It's pretty obvious stuff. You know, you're in a lifeboat. Uh, it can only take 30 people. You've already got 35 in the boat and there are other people swimming around in the sea. You have no choice. You know, if they grab the boat, you hit them with a hammer. That's, uh, I'm bringing that up because I honestly think that something similar is emerging uh, in this nexus between um, techno philosophy, let's say, these ideas like long termism or even effective altruism, um, and real material crises, climate change, uh, the large scale movement of people due, due to climate change and other disruptions like the ongoing colonialism and war that that um there's a agglomeration or, or a kind of convergence of uh, perspectives within all of these things that um sees it as regrettably necessary to to defend certain portions of uh of life and lived experience uh, by whatever means necessary and weirdly just to bring the eu back into the middle of that that's um pretty evident in eu border policy which Uncoincidentally, is where they see a lot of the applications of AI being. So all of these things, I know I'm, I'm joining a lot of, trying to join a lot of dots here and, and fold things over like some kind of mad recipe. But I think this is entanglement. This is how these things uh, play into each other and play back on each other. And for each of us, you know, we need to try to develop a, you know, a, a, huh. for each of us, we need to try to develop a a working picture, a working understanding of what that means for us and ours, the people that we care about and the world that we care about and what we're going to do about it. And um, the urgency for me around the AI that we have is that it's currently unreflective uh, development application unthinkingly or through the encouragement of unthinkingness plays right into the hands of uh, these very regressive agendas and uh, with such force that it's basically impossible to conceive of an AI for good at this moment in time. Now, um, you said, uh, saying as the OpenAI CEO, so Sam Altman again, mm. that we're all stochastic parrots, just like large language models, statistical generators of learned patterns that express nothing deeper now, you said that was a form of nihilism. Mm. What do you mean by that? Um, well, I'm handily citing someone else when I say that. But but it... But, but, but you think there's something yeah, deeper yeah, no, to, no, to but... human intelligence? Is, 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 that, is that the thing? Yeah, I don't think... I was having an interesting argument about this on social media, as you do, only yesterday. Um, and... I love the discourse around language. You know, clearly this is kind of a demonstration of its very nature, right? The idea that, well, more than language, dialogue, yeah. you know, is, um, you know, critical to whatever it means to have communication and, and understanding. And, you know, there's other things we've been talking about, meaning. Um, and actually that's why, you know, in the book, I do put quite a lot of emphasis on uh, spaces for collective discourse about things that need to be done, you know, which which I would put under the titles of things like workers' councils and people's councils. But that's essentially what it is, because those are transformative spaces. I mean, to some, you know, small or large extent, we come out of this conversation different to when we went into it. Um, so, so I'm saying all that because I don't want to in any way undermine. Uh, the importance of language and, and speech and discourse, which of course is what um, something like a large language model seems to do. I mean, I'd say it isn't doing that at all. It's, it's doing maths, which is fine, but um, I quite like maths. I don't think it's the same thing um, because I don't think that, for example, I think this actually is probably pretty indisputable that if I have a conversation, quote unquote, in my terms, with uh, GPT-4, let's say. Um, well, maybe I might change as part of that experience, but it isn't going to. Uh, 
other than perhaps, you know, ingesting its interaction with me and mathematically tuning its model to be a little bit more plausible next time. That's not what I mean. You know, I might transform my understanding of the world or what I attribute value and meaning to. Um, yeah, yeah, there is a, a singular mathematical value in what those machines are doing. They're optimizing uh, their mathematical output, their loss function or cost function, whatever it is. So uh, having said that, in a long-winded way, there's clearly more to being alive than words. You know, embodied experience, uh, meaning, and emotion, and empathy, and understanding um, what I care about. I mean, in so many ways, I, I agree with you. I, I was very influenced by Searle's Chinese room argument, mm. which is basically saying that syntax or semantics can't be derived from syntax, so from the form of language. But there are papers coming out that are showing that language models trained on the form of language can represent in a vector space a lot of things that we thought were in the realm of the subject of experience, right. like, for example, uh, color representation. Yeah, And I think everyone's pleasantly surprised by the receding horizon. I still believe that it, it, it can't recede much more. Mm. But there does appear to be a lot of the subjective experience captured in these models. It's a bit of a mm. mystery. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not saying, yeah, about the mystery of it so much as I agree with you in terms of the things that uh, these machines um, will, you know, can do. I mean, before the language models, I, you know, the idea of um, image recognition, convolutional neural networks could be trained to... Uh, recognize faces first off uh, and could do so you know under conditions of occlusion at a distance mm. or perhaps gate the, those kind of really um, probably everyone has had that experience of waiting for a friend you know perhaps uh, the light's not so good and you see them from a distance you need to know who they are and that feels like a moment of connection and um, not something that you'd expect a machine to be able to reproduce and they can and uh, I don't know whether I'm being obtuse. That doesn't give me any sense that the machine is uh, doing anything even like what I'm doing. When I, you know, there's an there's an emulation in some sense of that. I recognise that person's gait at a distance. They have learnt to recognise that. Per so I think recognition would be a fair statement. You know, that they would produce an output that would uh, classify it as that person under those conditions. That's fine. I mean, when I see that person, what's my experience? My experience of is of all the things that person means to me, of all those shared experiences, those those, those things we've done together, said to each other, um, experiences we've had or recounted to each other, what it means to be there waiting for that person at that moment. It's fine if you think that the language model is working towards that, then... I'm not here to prove you wrong. Mm. Uh, I don't believe it for a moment. Uh, I do struggle a bit with the overwhelming force of people's wish to believe in these things. That does seem to be very dominant at the moment. And to be honest, it's like really wearing. Um, yes. But uh, where I challenge you, and we're probably going to get onto a bit of that in a specific context as well, is that, okay, you think that, I don't think that. Uh, but let's look at the consequences of those thoughts, of those beliefs. What are the consequences? And, and it's two-way. You know, you can say to me, well, the consequences of your belief are that we're going to lose all these opportunities. We're perhaps going to leave people in a worse situation than they might have been because these things can be helpful. And I'd be saying to you that your beliefs are harmful and uh, complicit in forms of institutional and social violence. Hmm. So, you know, that's maybe where the cookie crumbles for me, you know. it's I'm, I'm not trying to convince you of a particular model of cognition. Um, I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm happy to explain what mine is, but mainly I'm concerned about where does that lead us. Uh, can, we'll segue back onto this point in a minute, but 
on on this understanding point in particular mm. there, there's philosophers have been talking about this for a very long time starting with descartes and mind body mm. dualism and cell one of his thought experiments was the essentially the um the ontological difference in understanding between someone who laughed at a joke right and um the computer just doing the the symbol manipulation yeah there's clearly an ontological difference yeah. And, and understanding is is about all of these contextual factors that you spoke of, whether it's semantics or pragmatics or the context, the purpose, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, but then you could argue, I mean, as David Chalmers did, you could have a philosophical zombie, which is you take a, a complete copy of a human atom by atom, mm. and they might behaviorally represent a human and be indistinguishable, mm. mimicry on a on a level which is indistinguishable but they don't have conscious experience. Mm. So you could always make the argue that there's something extra which is not captured by the system. But then I would I would say to you, what if you did have an AI which was a perfect form of mimicry, a perfect form of representation? Mm. Would you still think it was harmful? These are good questions. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be glad to hear, in my opinion, right? No, because that's. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna step sideways and say that's a philosophical question, right? Right, and it's that's good, right? I think philosophical questions are very useful. Um, uh, you know, because we all have a philosophy, whether we whether we like it or not, whether we think of it or not, we all have a philosophy, or like a mangled versions of philosophy. We have to in order to live. We have to have. An understanding of what it is to live and what life means and what's important and everything else and they do whether we like it or not or know it or not you know they have what other people would describe as epistemologies and ontologies wrapped up in them and philosophy serves a really useful uh, space there for actually stepping back from those things and 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 sort of coming at them from a different angle as you you were just doing and uh, i would just say that's a thought experiment mm. okay which is great you know and thought experiments are really important in physics which is like my you know, starting point, um, but they are thought experiments, and it's uh, you know quite dangerous to, I think, can be quite dangerous, can be risky, to adopt those thought experiments as other than thought experiments. I mean, actually, I was teaching the ethics. Uh, I teach a course in ethical computing. You won't be surprised to hear, and uh, you know, we were looking at self-driving cars. Yes, right, and the trolley problem. You know, the trolley problem is a thought experiment that's meant to illustrate, actually, weirdly, given our current times, you know, was really brought to prominence in debates around abortion, you know, back in back in the 60s, around around the Roe versus Wade decision. You know, that was a philosophical debate. Those were, those are uh, philosophical stances meant to bring out in us uh, aspects of a situation that we had maybe left unconsidered or underconsidered. They weren't meant to be interpreted literally as something you should program into a, you know, a two-ton piece of fast-moving metal as a way to decide how to target itself. That's that, it's a thought experiment. It's not an adequate, you know, uh, operational ethics. And s s something similar about this is like it's it's quite. I'm sure it's fruitful to consider that. That isn't my uh, priority my priority is to consider what i can materially see these machines are doing uh, at this moment in time and what their capacities seem to be and what impacts that has in the world so um could, could i push back yeah. on that a, yeah. a tiny bit because you mentioned the lifeboat example before and and we need we need philosophy to give us something which is fruitful and, and operational we do Otherwise, there's almost no point in doing it. I mean, you, uh, Floridi said to us, by the way, that, that philosophy should have a purpose. There, there's no point yeah. in f philosophers' problems. But in this particular case, isn't it quite similar to um, when when we speak about the um, emancipation and so on and, and, and even deleterious effects on society? Mm. Um, isn't that a, a similar form of trolley problem? Uh, well, lucky for me that I said thought experiments are useful. Oh, good. Yeah, you know, but but uh, but my thought experiments aren't meant to be interpreted uh, as you know 
full descriptions of reality or statements of fact or um, ideological prescriptions or anything else. I mean, I don't know what it, what what your line of questioning makes me think is, or what it makes me want to respond is like, I don't think we should really rely on philosophers yes. to guide life or society. I mean, that was, well, you know, that was Plato, I think, and that didn't sound particularly fun to me, although there are instantiations of societies right now which seem uncomfortably close to that. I think um, philosophy is a very fruitful domain. Um, we need, we will have philosophies. We need to have ways to develop our philosophies. But at the end, we shouldn't rely on philosophers to tell us what to do or to describe reality. They, they have a particular capacity and that's what they're doing. The people who should be defining reality is us who are living it. You know, my rule of thumb would be, uh, well, actually maybe take something from the disability movements, you know, which have a slogan since, I don't know, from a long time ago. Nothing about us without us. You know, that, that if something is being made or done or arranged that's going to affect your life, you should have a say in it. Mm -hmm. You should have a say in it. Yeah. Not that it should be guided by your favorite philosopher or somebody else's favorite philosopher. Philosopher is fine, but I'm not going to, arrange my life according to this philosopher or that philosopher or rely on them. It's only us. The life is a very complex, complicated, messy business. And each time, that's why dialogue is so important. We have to have that kind of discourse to together address the particular thing we're facing at that moment together. Is, is abstraction itself part of the problem or, or maybe reductionism is the word you would prefer because yeah. in this trolley problem, what they've done is they've removed as many details as possible. That, yeah, that's yeah, the design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that that's that's the issue. Yes, yes. I mean, you're right. And and I thought I saw a nice term for it actually as I was kind of reading back on that stuff. And you know, it's uh, it's a subset called a quandary problem. You know, you remove all of these uncertainties, like you say, all of the in fact, importantly, all of the other things you could have already done yes. to stop that situation coming away. And you just put yourself in the urgency. But um more importantly, the problem you you put you pose there or this idea you know what's the kind of um effect of abstraction or, or reduction i mean i think right at this moment uh, i would say that i i don't have a problem with abstraction or even reduction in some way they don't you know they seem to be tactics you know i, I i'm i guess i'm doing it right now you know I'm, I'm having to um schematize some of the stuff we're talking about because the, otherwise the complexities would be overwhelming as, as a way of navigating my way through it's like it's the climbing wall again you know i'm finding trying to find footholds in order to, to keep moving i think it's the it's idolatry that i'm concerned about it's like reifying those things as if they are um more profound uh more authoritative uh than what people happen to be really experiencing in their lives at any given moment so it's not so much the idea that abstraction you, know, you mustn't abstract things. I don't think we have that choice or that you mustn't sometimes reduce things. But there's a kind of, there's another end to that process as well, right? You, you yes. reduce things and abstract things in order to come back out again, in order to come back to shared lived experience. I, th I think it's about grounding then. Hmm. So the, um, you could go to the platonic realm where there's no grounding in, in reality at all. Mm. And then there's, there's these planes of reality and, and you think the, the appropriate plane to ground things in is the reality of our experience. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's probably a lot of, um, philosophical traps I'm in danger of sticking my foot right into here in terms of, um, you know, the sort of recursiveness, recursiveness of these things, which, which right. I think that's one thing. If one thing computer science has given to the world is an enhanced awareness of recursiveness. And, and it's kind of ever presence in our, in our ways of thinking about things, because, you know, even when we're thinking about thought, we're using thought to do that, you know? Yes. So, so I think recursiveness is always like a really good thing to bear in mind. That's kind of inescapable. Um, yeah. So, so you were asking about the, the, the kind of grounding. Yeah. Um, I think my, you know, I've, I've quite an, you know, having, having kind of dissed philosophy, I've got quite an affinity with process philosophy in the sense that, you know, it's, it's trying to remove our focus, uh, from the fixed, you know, to, 
my reading of it anyway, you know, towards the becoming. And I think if, if I was uh, committed to something, it's to the becomings, you know, uh, um, and I, I, I guess pragmatically, it seems to me that those becomings are shared, hmm. a share, you know, a shared product um, or, or imposed, you know, they're shared or imposed. And that's not an absolute division either, because all of these things are binaries. But I'm uh, mostly opposed to the imposed and mostly committed to the shared. Yes, and I think there's there's an interesting um, metaphor or analogy here. With I mean, part of the problem with AI models is is the sclerotic um, representational nature, mm. which is to say they they just take a snapshot and reinforce the status quo. And similarly with the process philosophy, um, you you don't like this sclerotic nature. You you prefer to think of a trajectory to somewhere rather than where we are now. Yes, well, it's not always dynamic unfolding. That gives us a possibility for change as well, you know. And I, I guess, to me, you know, my psychopolitics is that um, what keeps me going is a belief in the possibility of change. You know, that would be my yeah. dead end. On on that though, with pro progressivism in in general, is that focus on the philosophy of change a function of you not being happy with the status quo i mean if we were mm. in a world which you were completely content would that philosophy change yeah well you know i'm sure my wife would say it'd be very difficult to conceive of a world in which i was completely content <laughs> you know um uh and actually i don't think there would be one you know in in the sense that surely content and discontent are always you know again a, a kind of binary uh it's life i don't know i'm i've i've uh, accumulated a number of years of experience of life under my belt right and uh, you know it's it's messy and it's complicated and it's quite often painful and uh, compromising and i've now at my age done so many things that i said i would never say or do or you know um that that i don't see some kind of uh Certainly not a static utopia. I'm I'm a utopian in the sense that I believe there are many possibilities that are better than this one. Yes, but but there's this fascinating thing that let's say we we did move very close to your idea of of a for utopia, and then one way of looking at it is um, your happiness is is actually very relative. Like mm. it, it it's a function of of what's around you at the time, and that could mean one of two things. It could mean that you start to increase the resolution of your analysis. Mm. So. Um, you'll just zoom in and zoom in and, th and there'll always be um, hmm. giants to slay because you'll be focusing in on, on smaller and smaller things. Or, or another way of looking at it is maybe you would see a completely different paradigm as as, as the new destination. Yeah, I mean, it's that's kind of... Um, I mean, both have a kind of element of plausibility to me, but I think the point is it's very difficult to say, isn't it? Because we're we're participants in that process. Yeah, The we that we think, the, the, the me that I think I am right now, I mean, even... Coming to talk to you, I was I wasn't having a crisis of confidence, but I was thinking, oh, you know, he's been looking at stuff that I wrote five years ago, and do I really think that anymore? And who am I? And you yes. know, well, of course, I'm not the same person that I was five years ago, or will be in five minutes' time. And uh, all I can do is is kind of, it's kind of a constant process of course correction. I mean, I'm I'm here right now. This is what I think would be a good move. When I get to that point, who knows? Um, you know, there have been some constants. In I mean, it's useful also when you get a bit older to look back at some of the uh, themes, let's say. You know, the, the sort of, maybe not constants, but the certain recurring rhythms in there that everybody seems to carry with them. And, and I'm, I'm okay with mine, you know, and I think they, they are, have been a reasonably good rule of thumb for me in terms of um, finding, you know, some elements of happiness in this reality that is the one that we are experiencing right now, but also feeling that uh, particularly in a, a shared way that I've experimentally, experimentally experienced, I'm not quite sure that fits, but it's I've seen it, I've experienced it, I've understood it, and I know that it could be uh, more and wider, and I know that even if it's only simply because of the very visible, um, uh, incredible devotion of resources to not allowing that to happen. Hmm. If this was so unnatural, why put so much time and energy and force and violence into making sure that it doesn't happen? Well, I mean, there are some obvious reasons due to the 
which would be the distribution of resources in the current world, the, you know, the nature of some people feeling that they must be superior to other people and that division must be maintained. I mean, whatever your explanation for it is, I constantly observe the force with which those situations are maintained against something else. And it's that something else I'm interested in uh, trying to unlock. Okay, so um, you did a talk on mental health and AI, hmm. and you discussed the potential benefits and concerns of applying AI and machine learning techniques to mental health care, um, specifically through voice analysis, hmm. which I thought was quite interesting, highlighting the promise of early detection and, and intervention in, in mental health, but also looking at some of the potential um, drawbacks, hmm. especially with vulnerable populations that are being targeted. And you were also speaking to this concept of epistemic injustice, mm. which I think is particularly interesting. I mean, could you could you introduce that? Yeah, I'll try. Uh, with due apologies to Miranda Fricker, whose work it was that I read to right. try to, uh, because I think, uh, I'm, I don't know if she was the first to use the term, but she certainly wrote extensively about it. And that's where I borrowed it from. And I think, yeah, again, that comes out of the, uh, out of a sort of broadly, actually feminist philosophy and it would be a way of understanding um, women's experiences I think particularly women's experiences in that through that process of trying to uh, you know transform from being voiceless and she was trying to characterize I think what women's experiences uh, you know and we're talking still up until the present day you know typically can be and so she she um, actually had a a couple of levels of this, an epistemic injustice would be, um, uh, and a, a profuse apologies for not being able to recapitulate her very uh, succinct phrasings of it, but it'd be something like the devaluing of the speaker would be the epistemic one in there, or the devaluing of their knowledge of their own experience. So it, that's you know, it's that's simply the kind of thing where. Uh, somebody's own expression of their own subjective experience counts less than uh, essentially an exterior version of what uh, their experiences mean. So, so this is the, the tyranny of the algorithm. So the, the way the algorithms work mm. is they look at regularities. They, they look at the head of the distribution and then you have this long tail where you have all the entropy mm. gets snipped off is mm. it? because it's, it's, it's not represented. So, so you're you're essentially talking to the voice of the algorithm overpowering the the voices of yeah. people with lived experience. Well, the algorithm is, and that's why I borrowed the term because it seemed to be a neat fit with uh, my understanding of what's happening with algorithms, or could ha happen with a, you know, this kind of algorithmic authority. Uh, but maybe I can drop in what I think is an absolutely key point to um, all of the things I'm trying to say with all of this stuff, which is that's not uh, something new, that these algorithmic expression of it or the manifestation through AI or anything else is um, a difference and a continuity. It's a difference because of the particular way these things are done. And, uh, you know, they, they happen differently because of the technologies. Uh, they introduce a different dynamic and a different um, scale. Um, but they aren't, you know, that, that epistemic injustice wasn't, you know, Miranda Fricker didn't come up with that term because of algorithms. She came up with it because that's women's ongoing experience over whatever period of time you want to think about. Um, and it is, and this is maybe my thing, that, that that's going to be intensified potentially by, uh, you know, the rolling up into this idea of uh, algorithmic authority deriving from you know, it's somehow more objective and scientific and, uh, you know, grounded in data and whatever else it is that's used to attribute authority. I mean, she had another one about um, hermeneutic injustice. Yes. You know, so yes. it's like, it's not just the speaker's word, but the speaker's understanding. Yes. I mean, you, you could maybe, I've only just thought of this actually, but you could maybe think of that as a kind of, you know, she's really sort of, uh, she's dissing uh, sort of philosophical gaslighting there, you know, where, where somebody else's version of your... Uh, your experience of reality is more 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 valid than yours, and it and I think and I think that's not an accident. I mean, gaslighting is a very gendered. It's used against all of us, but it's a very gendered uh, technique, and it's a gendered technique that has been primarily mobilized in in 
uh, male dominant gender relations. And, you know, again, I mean, I, I tried to pick up on both of those because they seem very relevant to, to machine learning in general, or AI in general, particularly when it comes into the social realm, that it will have a voice that is uh, listened to more than the voice of the subject, let's say, you know, your interest in subjectivity, the subject hears the subject voice, certain subjects voices will count for far less than uh, a technical systems voice in that. And certain subjects, literal understanding of their own experience will count for far less. So it's a, uh, it's not, I don't think that's any particularly restricted to any domain. I mean, the, the unfortunate thing for me is to watch uh, some of my predictions about the way these things will work actually coming into practice. There was a good investigation by, um, well, by a group of people, <coughs> excuse me, under a, 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 um, a group, an investigative journalism organization called Lighthouse Reports were looking into now, this would be machine learning. It's not AI. So it's, I think it was random forests, actually, the particular algorithm. But it's a, a spotting welfare fraud. Yes. Right. And it's, you know, it was a very visceral kind of demonstration of this because on the, on the if you like, on the word of the algorithm hmm. was taken as having sort of sufficient weight that uh, people were literally had their sort of front doors battered down, more or less. And, you know, investigators going through their laundry and checking the number of toothbrushes on their in their bathroom or what have you because the algorithm had said it may be that they're actually living with a partner when they're claiming a single parent allowance or whatever it is you know they've been marked as suspicious now you know that's pulling together two things you know very starkly isn't it it's, you know it's like abs very abstract mathematical calculations based on data and real visceral lived experience and um i think that's yeah yes pretty good example of it well, that's a wonderful example. I mean, there, there's two components to that. I mean, first of all, even random forests, they're sufficiently complicated as to be unintelligible. Right. Um, just, just like a machine learning algorithm. And also it speaks to this concept of Goodhart's law, which is when an objective becomes a measure, it distorts the system. And that's because of a feedback loop. Yeah. So you can imagine yeah, yeah. when you start rendering judgments and then that actually affects the behavior of the underlying system, you get this very, very pernicious um, feedback loop. But um, the epistemic bit in particular is interesting because it, 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 you, you didn't use the term AI model. Epistemic speaks to this kind of collective knowledge we have, which can then be used to oppress marginalized uh, communities, and, and that will become reinforcing. And that there was actually a third form of epistemic injustice hmm. called testimonial injustice. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. And this happens when someone's credibility as a source of information is unfairly dismissed or diminished usually due to uh, prejudices or stereotypes associated with their identity or, or, or social group, reinforcing marginalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny you should say that because when I was thinking about the, the example I just cited, that was in Rotterdam, um, of, of, of the random forest fraud detection. It's also another, maybe in law, but um, I won't call it McQuillan's law, but a rule of thumb would be that uh, whatever you think, not you personally, but whatever uh, practitioners may think they are designing a system for, um, if they are kind of blithely ignoring um, the way our current systems actually work, then those could have what might be to their creators very unintended and um, harmful effects. And what I'm trying to get at there is... Uh, Suspicion, you know, this this, I, th th this positioning of certain people as always being suspicious, uh, of being uh, subject to suspicion. And that is really, you know, a very socially striated experience, you know, which probably we don't experience that much and other people experience all the time. You know, that their word is doubted because they are, after all, whatever, you know, from a housing estate in Tottenham and it's very clear that's where they're from you know their word will immediately um, count for less when it comes to any uh, debate about what's really happened in a given situation and that's something that happens it's not the fault of machine learning but if it gets embedded in the model and gets reinforced in the model as you were describing then I think it yes it becomes our shared problem in a sense it, it is the fault of machine learning and you can disentangle the algorithm from 
the the way the the data is structured. I mean, data scientists they do feature engineering. Hmm. They do what they call business analysis, and they understand useful abstractions. They transform the data, hmm. and you can imagine how once that schema becomes crystallized mm. it will have exactly the reinforcing epistemic injustice that that you speak to yeah that it's from a responsibility point of view it's like the um the the thought experiment of the drone operator right. is it the drone is it the operator does it matter that the operator is on the other side of the world it becomes sufficiently diffuse mm. that it's quite difficult to pin down responsibility and and what should be done but it's, it's your it's going back to the, the the term that you raised again which is entanglement it's like our prior ways of thinking about this kind of thing has been to try to um divide up responsibility in a very particular way because it was uh, it sort of worked pragmatically even if it wasn't always um if it could it would always be questioned to some extent you know but we well pragmatically have to do that and also we constructed legal frameworks to do that um you know that say well under under this because any real process is quite entangled anyway, but under this particular situation, we will we will assign the majority of blame to this particular actor, or maybe to this particular system. You know, that's um, why we have safety standards or whatever it is. Um, and the, you know, the the like it's like drone operator is like it's one word, isn't it? Mm. It's the inseparable drone and operator system. In actual fact, those systems are actually a lot larger because the drone operator is only one part of a much larger thing which has. Um, hierarchical order giving structures it has satellite data you know these things are very entangled and it, you know it sounds to me like maybe I don't know if you're saying this but that's what it's making me think of is that part of the task at the moment is to to reconceive of, uh, of responsibility frameworks you know in a way that that we can work with these uh, much more uh, intensified uh, or highly fused entanglements you know it's never really been possible to separate people from their tools but um it's certainly impossible with these new tools. And uh, if we're going to understand how to not just hold people responsible, but how to do things responsibly, then we, we do need to think about how, how, to, how to reconceive of those things. But it, all, it also made me, before I lose it, because you, you mentioned a minute ago, um, uh, you know, the interpretation of humor and jokes. Mm. And I don't know whether you had it in mind, but in the I think the paper OpenAI put out introducing GPT-4, I think one of the examples they give is it successfully interpreting, uh, interpreting a joke. Or was that the one with the VGA connector plugged into the phone? No, that's, a, oh, m maybe, maybe this is from a different paper, but I'm, yeah, uh, I might be getting confused, but this is the more layers one, you know, more as an M-O-A-R. Oh, okay. More yeah. Layers. So yeah. it's, it's a, I'm not, I don't know if it's next KCD, but it could well be, but it's a two panel joke basically where, um, the first one is a data scientist doing the things you were talking about of, of like, uh, you know, going, oh, you know, we need to think about these parameters and, you know, this particular situation, we need to get an expert in for this. That's the first panel. And the second panel is just another uh, stick figure going, more layers. And it's deep yes, learning. Yes. And, and so the, okay, the reason I'm bringing this out is the punchline here is not just that is the punchline. That's a, okay, that's a funny joke for the people who are in, who are on the inside. I think that's funny. You probably think that's funny. Yeah. It's funny for the deep learning people because it's like funny, we won kind of funny as well. Like like kind of screw you, backward looking data scientist. You know I can just add more layers and data and 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 you know look actually I win. I I do deep mind. I do open AI. I I win. And there's that hubris in it. But the point of it is, it was in the paper and they allegedly got a GPT to explain the joke, which it it does. You know explains the fact that. Um, here in the first panel is the old-fashioned machine learning data scientist having to do lots of uh, feature engineering in order to achieve a moderate result. And here, in, you know, it explains the joke. The joke for me, in the not really very funny sense, is that um, it's that those two panels, sh what the vector they show, is from. I ag agree with you about the rigidity of the models and the, the tyranny that they may involve. But at least at that stage, they were having to think about the context. They were having to maybe engage a domain expert at some point. I'm not saying it was ever very um, empowering or that they went as far as to actually get the users in or anything like as outrageous as that. But they did at least think about the situation. And 
what I'm saying there is there's a trajectory of thought, increased thoughtlessness, mm. moving, you know, in the deep learning uh, triumphalism is like, we don't need that stuff anymore. We don't need to understand. We have generalizable models that are so successful. We just seem to point our space cannon in the right direction and we can solve education. We can solve healthcare. We can solve COVID. Except that didn't really work, did it? But never mind. Um, you know, we, we are the new gods striding the earth. Okay, I'm having a dig. The more powerful effect is one that is again is historical i mean i take my reading from hannah arendt this idea of thoughtlessness and i suspect we'll get around to the conversation about terms like fascism but she developed that through attending the trial of eichmann and saying how is it that a pallid characterless um semi-zombie-like character like this an utter boring bureaucrat could be responsible for so much evil and she read through that uh, you know this idea of systems that uh, allow people not to think in a way and so for, <laughs> this is a really long-winded way of explaining my own joke my joke is that that's there's gpt identifying the very trajectory which it itself is encouraging which is one of increased thoughtlessness and therefore harm in the world and its own successful reading of this joke is, is just another ratcheting up of that very idea that these language models, I don't want to go back to all the conversation, but these language models are harmful in the world. So I just wanted to yes. get that in there. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, first of all, I, I could pose that another alternative is the language model might give you some abstraction and give you, because a, a, a lot of communication is about we have shared world knowledge, we have shared abstractions which live in our language. Yeah. And um there's a there's a kind of compression when we communicate. Yeah. And part of what we're doing is is I know what you know, I have a theory of mind, I communicate yes. to you. Yes. And in a way I'm I'm trying to be sufficiently representative, but also reducing the amount of cognitive work that you need to do. Yeah. And so if the model did provide a more of an abstract answer which could actually counterpose this relational view that you're just speaking to well yeah. this is funny from the point of view of this person yeah but that's not the magic of language models that they, they give you a very concrete example example which actually makes you lazy and it and it truncates your frame of reference your yeah. space of cognition um you know which i i agree with what chomsky said recently it, it, it's you could argue it both ways you could argue that it makes you lazy it makes you a zombie the somberfication of society mm -hmm. or you could argue that like sat nav did it actually kind of opens you up gives you more time mm -hmm. like the emancipation of women for example after um you know like the, the pill and washing machines and mm -hmm. so on that, that mm -hmm. there's a form of emancip emancipation there. um but um but another interesting point though just to push back a tiny bit yeah. Is you could argue, we've just said epistemic injustice models, isn't language a model, mm. right? So already the terms that we use, and, and we've, we've done this language game, yeah. we've converged, we've materialized on yeah. common understandings. And, and I know in postmodernism, language is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even forgetting about AI for a minute, like, isn't language extremely oppressive? Can be, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess the sense I get from, from your, the, the, the situation you're posing is simply that um, it's not that what the machines are doing, again, is something so radically different. It's that if we want to have uh, and share and, and sort of maybe debate or even contest models of the world, um, I don't really, I'm not motivated to go through a machine to do that. Hmm. I'm not motivated to, to pile all of human discourse into that mathematical, large mathematical transformation function with all of the additional um, limitations that that brings in order to bring it back out for my understanding. Hmm. I'd rather just talk to you or talk to other people who have some other kind of problem or get people together to discuss their shared problems. Because in the process of having to do it through the machine, it might sometimes be kind of entertaining, actually, you know, 
Um, I'm, I'm a bit sort of, I don't know what it is. I mean, because I think about these things too much, I see GPT-3 or GPT-3.5 or GPT, I haven't seen much out of GPT-4 myself yet. I'm like, the amazement for me has gone in about half a second. I'm like, yeah, okay. So, so I'm kind of, so what? Do you know, I just don't care uh, because it's still just a music box. It's still just a trick, a mathematical operation that emulates something that I care about. And it's not something that I care about. And uh, where am I going to do with this? Yeah, the, the point being that that diversion itself comes with the ghost labor that we talked about, you know, the, the mm -hmm. sort of marginalized labor. It comes with a ridiculous allocation of resources, money and time and people, people's thought, or well, that thought could be thinking something else. And let's not even go into the, the carbon emissions. You know, this is, this is a, an insane machine to build. Why would I build this insane machine in terms of its uh, resource capture Never, never mind its attempts at hegemony in order to say, well, I could use it to reflect back on things that other people have said. Thanks. There are better ways to do that. Hmm. Oh, they'll stick around. Don't worry about that. Oh my God, you're telling me I can expect some angry emails. <laughs> it's funny, you know, like, uh, uh, like becoming a bit more well-known or whatever that is. I'm getting some weird shit on social media now, which I was never had, you know, because I was always in my little, bub not my bubble, but my little intersectional bubble, you know, and I, I just never had that internet shit. I always get people like popping up on my timeline going, well, you know, uh, just whatever, really. I'm I'm finally tired of you what you're saying. is like, A, I didn't even know you were listening and B, I don't give a shit. Yeah. Don't read the comments on YouTube. Right. Right. God. Yeah. 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 You really are. You're in that space. Um, well, to be honest, I, I've, I've done very well, but, um, the space that you're in does does invite yeah. does invite some nasty comments. I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, okay, so in in the last chapter of your book, the anti-fascist AI, uh, you argued for for this approach to AI, which goes beyond immediate resistance to algorithmic violence and fascistic solutionism, mm. instead aiming to shift the focus from resisting AI to restructuring the conditions that give rise to AI in the first place, which we spoke to. Yeah. So you said that such an approach must be decolonial and feminist, as AI is both colonial in its intellectual framework and racialized properties of exteriation and exclusion, as well as enabling gender-based violence and promoting violently patriarchal systems. Mm -hmm. So you advocated for the construction of an apparatus that supports the common good based on the principles such as democratic self-governance and also commitment to transformative system change and horizontal cooperation. So, um, yeah, you, you, you said an anti-fascist approach to AI is one that is prepared to no platform, any sign of fascistic solutionism hmm. or its normalization. And maybe I should just quickly ask about the language hmm. a little bit, because when I, when I first read this, um, some of the language seemed slightly kind of charged to me and I'm, I'm an outside, uh, an outsider to this domain. So um, some language such as anti-fascist, decolonial, feminist, mm. um, you know, and, and the, the association with violence stood mm. out in particular. So I just wondered if you could elaborate on the motivations behind your choice of language, its historical and intellectual origins, and how you believe employing such, such language contributes or enhances your work in addressing uh, the ethics project. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I hope it's, um, I hope it's more than slightly charged. You know, I hope it's very charged. Right? Yes, I was being. Uh, I think yeah. you're being very yeah polite. You're a very polite host. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes. Um, so it's meant to be very charged, um, and it's not meant to be. Um, it's not trying to be in people's faces for the sake of it. But maybe the common one common strand we could start with there is, um, as you mentioned, there's other things, decolonial feminists, and so forth. I think maybe, or, or and also something you referred to a minute ago about. Um, let's say the term administrative violence. I think you're right. You know, there's, there's a strand of concern in my thinking that uh, doesn't stray too far from concerns about violence. And that's because I, you know, I do see uh, systemic violence at all levels in the here and now. Uh, I mean, I will say universal credit. 
you know, universal credit seems to me like a violent system in the sense that, and I, and I am pretty sure it's deliberately designed this way, um, that, you know, giving as it does people very explicitly the absolute minimum to live on and then uh, arranging uh, a series of potentially sanctionable uh, events which um, are very hard to completely avoid, especially if your life is kind of complicated and difficult and uh, restricted, uh, to the, so that you get sanctioned to only 70% of what the benefit itself establishes is its own minimal level of livability is violent. You're removing from people in a relatively arbitrary way the simple means of existence. And I think we can see these kind of violences all around us right now, the idea that Shell should be taking over Avedon, and billions it was in profit at the same time that, you know, people are having to choose between feeding their kids or heating their homes. This is violent to me. These are not, violence is not just a, a blow. You know, it's not just a, a directed physical attack of one person or another. It's, it's uh, to me, you know, things that... Uh, violently render us under people's capacity to um, live at what we would consider bare minimum conditions of um, existence and uh, um, lack of suffering. And mm. so in all of the things that, you know, you, you name check there, there are kinds of violences. You know, I think most people would understand that colonialism was kind of at least established by violence. But then There are other kinds. There are other kinds of violence that, um, well, st still, you know, we, we've said and colonialism never really went away. But there are many kinds of violence there, going back to the kind of uh, violent injustices of epistemic and testimonial and hermeneutic. You know that the colonialized people's own sense of themselves was violently transformed. So, so. I see, like, sound like somebody who sees violence everywhere, but I think it's important to recognise violent elements in all of these relations because actually, a lot of the time they are really just violent. You know that. But could yeah. could could I um, frame it a little yeah. bit? So as you said, when when I place a gun to someone's head, that's clearly violence. It's about intelligibility. Yeah. And I think you're speaking to a form of exasperation when, as as things as the scale, um, you know, increases. Um, especially over time and space, right. things diffuse right. and our um, moral intuitions become faulty. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm zooming out a little bit. I'm drawing a boundary around this. Yeah. And it's a little bit like I, if I poison a well for 50 years, people might slowly die of cancer and so right. on. And you're saying that's violence, yeah. but most people don't see it that way. So yeah. I'm going to use charged language to help you understand. I think that's a fair, uh, you know, that, that's a fair characterization of it. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, it relates to our earlier discussions about entanglement. I mean, these, this is also addressing entanglement. Um, it's also addressing the thing I was saying a minute ago about thoughtlessness. To me, thoughtlessness is because on the other hand, I really don't think that a lot of the time these things are that distant. You know, it's not hard for Okay, somebody working in it. Let's let's. I'm just going to stick with the benefits thing because it's right at the front of my mind. Okay, we already know that the worker who sanctions that person is aware of what they're doing. They can see the immediate impacts. They're driven by many things. Their own need to keep a job. Um, the fact that they may get, a, as as it turns out, a benefit, you know, a bonus for sanctioning. That's maybe we could all understand that that's directly complicit in some way. But then there's the manager you were talking about the power of metrics earlier on there's the manager sitting in the back office there who has to fulfill uh, has to fill a spreadsheet has to fulfill a you know get uh, get the right readings on a dashboard whatever it is that they're being assessed by they have some sense of what they're doing of course it is somewhat insulated but i don't think it's to, to me it's it's not so insulated i think we've been trained to not see these things i don't think it's that i'm trying to do something or but by doing what you characterize it's not, uh, it's not an elaborate operation, you know. It's really that most of the time we've been taught not to look. Yes, yeah, so it's similar to that thought experiment where a fisherman um, catches fish, and and the the coarseness of the net means that some fish 
go through the net and we just don't we don't see those fish because they don't get caught by the net so you're saying there's a fundamental structure there which affects our default ability to recognize things yeah and i think that's a highly conditioned one and a highly you know it's not somebody sat down in a back room to design it it's an emergent property of a system that relies on that uh width of hole in the net in order to sustain itself you know it's self-reinforcing so that we're looking at that's again maybe why thinking about technical systems is also a useful tool more broadly because you know we're thinking about feedback loops but actually feedback loops are everywhere and reinforcements and layerings and recursiveness i mean all of these things are already happening in these systems and and and, and they do reduce as violence so yeah i mean i'm using language about um violence is also maybe just because um yeah another consequence of the apparent abstraction of technical systems their apparent complexity their apparent removal from the realms of everyday life um and actually the real physical and semantic removal of the people producing those systems you know it exist uh, a lot of the time i mean you know neurips or whatever you want to say is a is a it's a long way from tottenham hmm. okay in one sense you know, people are inhabiting a, or have a habitus that's very, very different. And that is not accidental. That's constructed to be that way um, as a door, you know, as a Mandarin wandering the halls of Whitehall, um, you know, is is constructed to be making decisions at a sufficient distance from the possible consequences, because otherwise it would actually be very difficult to do those things. Um, and I'm saying, let's make it difficult. Let's make it difficult to do those things without understanding the consequences for people's lived experiences which i would describe as as forms of violence so at the very least leaving aside the fascistic thing which we can talk about but just the violent uh, violence maybe in the language i don't know but the bringing in to focus the violence is yet yeah, that's quite um yeah quite deliberate because there's a few things there. i mean first of all as as we said language is a model just like a machine learning mm. algorithm so i can understand why an attempt to reframe the language, for example, the term fascism or even racism mm. uh, as well, I think is another another good example. But you, you could push back on, on that and say, to what extent does it um, dilute or trivialize the word? Mm. And and also, because now you, what, what you've essentially done is, is abstracted the term. Mm. And that abstraction makes certain assumptions and extrapolations, which might have, uh, yeah. you know, might be slightly opinionated. But on, on the dilution thing, um, we'll leave racism to one side, but maybe fascism is a better yeah. example. I mean, would you, would you, do you think it dilutes the notion? I mean, m most people would say Vladimir Putin is a fascist at this yeah. point. Some people, even Donald Trump. And do you think in any way this overloading of the term kind of dilutes that meaning? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay, I'm just being glib. I think... I think, no, okay, I think it's important to be quite precise about what fascism is. I may or may not have done that job in the book. I tried. Um, because I think fascism isn't, isn't neatly separable. That's the point. But it is particular. I don't think we're, we, you and I, are not living in fascism at the moment. Um, and if it comes to that, we'll know it. It's a very particular political and social formation um i think we can see fascistic activity around us right now i think you'd have to be blind in the uk of 2023 not to see uh the rise of fascist intervention in social conflict the crowds uh you know fighting to get into hotels into the hotel inn where uh, asylum seekers are being housed it's it's real but it's not the dominant system in our society thankfully uh, i think it's pretty close in some others um so my my purpose of talking about fascism is it's multiple in one way i am saying that yes actually really existing historically definable fascism is actually a problem right now it's more powerful and more widely um, adopted than 
uh, probably ever has been in my lifetime. Um, then there are reasons for that, because if you study the historical actuality of fascism, it tends to emerge as uh, a solution to crises, crises usually of the hegemonic dominant whatever system. I think, you know, so, so are there, there are these reasons, right? There are reasons why, I mean, they're always fascists. There are always a, a small number of people who, through their own, uh, their own damaged character, choose to believe in these things. Most of the time, like any other extremist and, and distorted belief system, it's it's always there, but it's it's marginal because most people are basically, thankfully, despite our experiences, relatively filled with common sense and and sort of a reasonable amount of respect for each other. I, I do believe that's the dominant force most of the time. But um, would, yeah. would you agree that that this argument that it's a form of abstract fascism uh -huh. in 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 the sense that before the term connoted physical violence and now we're in the infosphere and oppression is different and just like in the infosphere there's increasingly less friction with the legal landscape it's very difficult laws don't work anymore with these tech companies and mm. similarly with with oppression it's becoming far more abstract and unintelligible so it's almost like we we need to re change the meaning of the word to help people recognize what it is okay i think i'm starting to get wh where you're coming from um and i think you're you know you're trying to give a sort of the way i'm interpreting it is you're trying to give some validity to my use of the term as being a sort of uh trying to uh, forefront some important aspects of a situation that has become more diffuse and, and abstracted and and trying to bring certain consequences into into focus yeah Thanks. It's not what, what I think I'm doing. Okay, go on. Yeah. Uh, you know, because what, what I think I'm doing is, is, is trying to do a couple of things. One is I'm saying, no, no, really, no, actual fascism, real fascism, historical fascism. It's, um, we should be forefronting a concern for fascism in this society, in our world right now. Uh, we have a fascist prime minister in Italy. Not, 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 Somebody who is proto-fascist or explicitly, that is a fascist party, was a fascist party since it was founded in the early 1950s. You know, it was a, it was a pro-Mussolini party. It's a fascist party and she's a prime minister in Italy. We have fascistic governments in Hungary, in re religious fasc fascism in Poland. Th these are not abstract, distant possibilities. And this is one of the things about fascism is that nobody really believes it until it happens. That's yes. one of its successes, right? That we wake up one day and we have the system, and then it's too late. That's when. Sorry, could, could, could you just um, for the for the benefit of the audience, because you you started to define it, and then yeah. and then I think you moved on. But you, you yeah. said it, it's about responding to crises and so on. Because I, I think with with a definition that would get away from any notion of abstract fascism. Sure. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, the reason why it's quite even different to far right politics, and I mean, you know, we we have a kind of um, well, you and I, although you know slightly different sort of uh, generations still inherited an idea of left and right, which I think itself is pretty fragmented now, actually, and not that helpful. Most of us got an idea of what the far right means. The fascism is not the far right only. It's, it's kind of beyond the far right. And so what is a fascistic, uh, let's say, regime is actually a revolutionary one in some way. You know, it's not simply a takeover of the existing regime. It's one that uh, mobilizes a takeover of the, of the existing regime but, you know, with this ideology of, tra of the necessity of radical transformation, of the untenability of the existing status quo or um, the existing um, uh, falling apart of the status quo. Right? So it's, it's, it's transformative. It, it, it uh, requires a new being, you know, that, that people themselves are transformed. Um, it requires a, it establishes a unity but it establishes a unity which is, of, of course, like absolutely exclusionary. It establishes a unity in opposition to, you know, there's always an other with fascism. And that other is, is the great threat to, to our existence. Yes. So, so it, it describes a um, chaotic, transient consolidation of power. 
yes, a violent transformation of power through an ideology of um, of transcendence, of transcending the, the uh, current situation to a new purified, uh, uh, a new purified world that at the same time is a return to a lost world. So, you know, you, you know there's this always uh, very visible in, in, in fascistic um, narratives, you know, is the idea that there was a better time. Right. But I think that part might be missing from the AI because I, I don't, I'm not hearing the message that we want to go back to a previous good world. It, it seems yeah. quite utopian in the sense of there is a, an exciting new world. Yeah, we yeah, can... yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not saying that AI is fascist. Right. Um, because fascism is a political category. And what I'm trying to explore is, is this, this idea of a technopolitics. So I am saying that certain of the affordances of AI or some of its very concrete and, and seeming to me irretrievable characteristics are potentially fascistic. And, and, and that maybe that's the other side of things really is the, this is again, what I'm trying to hit with this is the difference between um, some concerned views of AI, which is about bias and discrimination. And that's where often the ethics comes into it that you, you're referring to. You know that we're going to have a situation that sort of um, really unfairly tips the balance. You know, and where I, what I'm trying to allude to is that um, well, first off, that, that balance doesn't exist. You know, we're not starting from a level playing field. Um, but not only are we not starting from a level playing field, that there is within the highly unequal and asymmetric and I would say violent uh, aspects of society that we currently inhabit are the makings of that future fascism in one way or another. And there are, there are trackable tendencies that enhance that possibility. Othering, clearly, that would be one. Um, essentializing, uh, you know, uh, ordering things in terms of us and them and in and out. Um, these are all, they're not uh, fascism, but they're kind of aspects that... Uh, are used to to substantiate and reinforce and develop fascism if it arises. And that's why I think we have to be very, very concerned because actually the, you, 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 you know, if, if, if I think was picking up on something you said, you know, that you're kind of, I think, alluding to the idea, which is um, reasonably well discussed, that these systems escape the law in some way, right? That that's part yes. of the problem, right? Yeah. And I'm saying that isn't the problem. Yes. Right? I'm saying that the law already doesn't restrain the things we should be worried about. That the law already, in fact, validates some of the things that we should be worried about. That the law, what these uh, intensified effects are showing is not that the things are escaping the law, they're showing exactly why the law itself is not the solution. I mean, something that historically uh, people sort of is often is misrepresented is this sense of, uh, for example, Nazi Germany as a dictatorship. It was a legal structure. It was, it was always uh, legally enabled, le legally enacted. Okay, the forms of law that were introduced to enact a Nazi regime and extend it and deepen it, you know, leading up to the war, um, you know, were largely based on creating, as Agamben said, zones of exception, you know, areas in which other in which protections of the law did not apply to certain groups of people but that was done legally I mean, on, on that i mean i spoke to pluridi about this and he said part of the problem is the the pace and scale it's unprecedented right. and you could also argue that there is just a fundamental mismatch between the needs of corporations and society and so on yeah but um what what folks like Floridi say is that we need to have strong institutions and institutions that can keep up with the pace of change of technology um, so that we can change the legal um, interface mm. to reduce the brittleness with the technology landscape so that right. there's there's this idea that if only we could keep pace and have the correct governance and, mm. and legislation mm. then it wouldn't be a problem right 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 would you push back on that? Oh, great. I get to do some pushing back. Yeah. Please. <laughs> uh, 
No, you've been so kind of, you've been so sort of um, gentle with your pushing back. I, I kept making you say, oh, push back harder. It's okay. Um, yeah, I would push back on that, definitely. I think, um, you know, I, I, I agree that, of course, one of the challenges of the transformative technologies is pace and scale, particularly scale, actually. Um, but, but, you know, but my, my um, you know, my warning light would be not only that, but that in context. Uh, I picked up a phrase a couple of months ago, polycrisis. Have you heard that one? <laughs> it's like um, omni-shambles. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. The, okay, it yeah. is, exactly. It's just, a, it's just a posher way of saying omni-shambles. I mean, but, or, or at least it's, it's kind of identifying um, a number of very specific crises, right? We've got the climate crisis, oh, uh, perhaps overarching everything. Um, we've got, I mean, we're speaking now, you know, in mid-March when we've just maybe apparently dodged another financial collapse, maybe Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, look at it, it all somehow circulates back to Silicon Valley, right? Um, you know, we don't know yet if we successfully avoided that, but maybe it seems like we did. You know, so anyway, we've got austerity still ongoing, right? We've got the financial collapse. We've got um, war in Europe, yeah. right? So we, we've got m many overlapping crises, the polycrisis, the omni shambles, you know, um, and I'm just saying that alongside what you were just saying, because um, it's not just perhaps urging the caution about how oh, we're, we're reducing radically transformative technologies at a pace that we find difficult to conceive of. Okay. And we're doing it in a situation where pretty much everything is falling apart at a rate that we also seemingly find difficult to conceive of because we've definitely not got a handle on it. And the, the, and the particular way I push back against the institutional thing is because institutions are entirely complicit in that. Well, to, similarly with um, Silicon Valley Bank in the UK, you know how it works. Um, a lot of it is about perceptions in the market and confidence. For sure. And uh, Sunak, our prime minister, he very quickly um, became the guarantor mm. for the um, companies in the UK who had received investment. Yeah. But that's a great example of, of, you would say, that the failure of government and institutions because the the prevailing paradigm with markets and corporations and, and private enterprise that is too big to fail and it has to come first. Yeah, it has to come. I think you nailed it. Yeah, it has to come first before, I don't know, the kids who don't get school meals. Yes. Why does that have to come first? Why I say, well, I mean, I understand that like financial collapse is not going to be good for any of us. But but yeah, you, you nailed it. But I think it's not, I'm not imagining sort of a world without institutions per se, you know, or rather let's say, I'm, not, I'm certainly not promoting an, an, a world without organisation. But I think the thing that keeps those things on track as much as they ever are is is other forces. You know, it's um, to some extent whether we'll put up with it. You know, we we, we do, and, and and certainly in the UK at the moment, we seem to be putting up with a hell of a lot. You know, I I honestly expected um, there to be, well, to, to be honest, much more civil unrest by this stage, given the kind of suffering that people are experiencing. But, but that's another form yeah. of abstraction, which is to say, mm. we say we need institutions because we need expertise. Mm. And I think the, the demos have accepted this notion to a certain extent, maybe more skeptical after COVID, but mm. this notion that these things are unintelligible to a certain extent, and we need to have powerful institutions who understand this stuff, who can make decisions on, on our behalf. So there are many layers of misdirection and abstraction between the the voting public and and how yeah, power yeah, is yeah. is yielded. I I um I I don't buy it. Right. Uh, well, how how could it be different? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the interesting question for me. Um, I don't buy it because, and and I'm trying to move to the how it could be different. I don't buy it because, um, there's an element of of, of quite extreme reductionism in there. You know that that. Um, th things are unintelligible that I, I, I agree with you know things are, are sort of fundamentally unintelligible but that doesn't mean we can't get a handle on them to, you know to a in a pragmatic way uh, and it's how we do that and if we invest all that you know let's 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 keep it grounded in the thing that we sort of came together to talk about the algorithmic systems or the AI systems because they are definitely being looked to as things that have sufficient scale uh, you know capacity to to to, I, I honestly think actually that the people who 
are used to that way of thinking that you know we need to have a few experts in the middle holding this ship together because otherwise our wheels are really going to come off look at the jittering the things already you know we need it you need it. only us are holding it together we're the, we're the thin blue line at the middle here we're holding it together and and actually that's not working what have we got in our toolbox ai ai is going to help save the day right and anyway i don't really buy that original model in the first place i do think that if um um, actually a more stable system is going to emerge it will be much more plural and i think maybe this is something we could probably from things that you've said to me already before that we we might find some sort of common ground on that, that pluralism actually is really really important and that um actually it already exists if you look at if you sort of start to to do that zoning in you were talking about into society you'll find that at every level of society i mean our park the little one where I go and walk the dog only exists because there is a sufficient sort of strength in the local park users group, mm -hmm. you know, to first maintain it as a semi-hygienic environment and also to push back against those different forces, whether it's the council or the school next door, whoever it is, you know, who would for one of their own reasons perhaps want to, to, to rather that wasn't there. This is this kind of balance of, of forces to this dynamic balance. You know, this pluralism is necessary and, for my opinion, the expertise that I most value is the ones most closest to the thing. It's not that I'm devaluing philosophers or uh, technologists or um, medics, you know, or any other uh, highly distilled form of expertise in its place, you know, as part of that. But that's the primary expertise. Yes, yes. But um, you can view this at multiple scales. Yes. So you're talking about yeah. self-organization at successive scales. Yes. And the type of self-organization you're speaking to works very well at the scale where it is manageable right. and intelligible. It's a similar thing with, with the COVID rollout. So the government have folks who are managing the, you know, how, how they do the, the um, vaccinations yeah. in various different parts. And, and yeah. it's an organizational nightmare. And it requires a certain skill set. And to be honest, they didn't do a very good job of it anyway. Yeah. But you, you, you can see how when, when, you, when you scale this up to the, the nation level, it becomes very, very difficult. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Sorry. I'm only thinking I don't really consider the nation to be particularly important. Uh, My apologies. No, no, yes. no, no, no borders. No yeah, borders. Yeah, no borders. Yeah. But anyway, okay. There has to be some coordination at different scale, definitely. And I mean, that's yeah. why I'm interested in, you know, I don't know if you're, if you know a book, what's it called actually? Uh, it's Andrew Pickering book on, on sort of lost cybernetics. The lost oh yeah. You mentioned that on your yeah. YouTube video. Right. Yeah. right. The, yeah. The, 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 you know, the, the sort of Stafford beer style cybernetics and, you yeah. know, which they in turn sort of modeled on, you know, allegedly modeled on, on biological organisms. But anyway, I don't know. I don't really care. It does seem to have some value in the sense that uh, actually it's sort of building on recursiveness to some extent mm. you know it's it's um it's not saying that uh, the local is um in some way above all and sacrosanct and has no relation to the wider situation because of course it does um none of us could survive town and country you know town and country didn't have something to do with each other um but but it's it's trying to build a situation that you know and you in, in you were saying you know earlier on like but it's kind of bottom up um but it's layering on um uh, um, dimensions of coordination sort of at their appropriate level that, that need to come into play so that one works inside the other, that there's kind of a local autonomy, but that autonomy is also uh, at, at a level when things that might be decided at a local level also have an impact, you know, let's say on the park in the neighboring borough, then there has to be a sort of parks coordination level and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, while the, the, the you know while the construction of of this of um what's it called oh, I've temporarily forgotten the name of Stafford Beer's model but the construction of the various ways of of, of of cyberneticizing those systems are are kind of a little bit fiddly and complicated they seem like a good start of 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 conceiving of pragmatic ways of organisation that acknowledge the vital role of um, local expertise. Um, and then the vital role of the next layer, and then the vital role of the next layer, without elevating any one of those mm. into being the one in charge. It's saying that actually, in reality, none of these things is in charge. And I'm sure if you were to actually get Rishi Sunak in a quiet moment, he'd say, I don't really feel like I'm in charge either. You know, I'm buffeted by world forces. You know, I have my the, you know, the right wing of my party trying to stab me in the back. It's like, it's funny, isn't it? It turns out that actually very few uh, scenarios turn out to be really in charge. Well, that's a very interesting observation because power is actually um, 
the way we perceive it and the way it is are two very different things. So we perceive Sunak as having a lot of power. Right. right. And when you're actually in Sunak's shoes, right. he'll tell you he doesn't actually have any power. But but then there's this notion of him. <laughs> exactly. But then there's this notion of, as you say, uh, I spoke with Carl Friston actually um, a couple of weeks ago. He's a famous neuroscientist and, and, and he has this notion of um, collective intelligence, mm. which uses his free energy principle. And you can, you can apply this everywhere. Even in a human, you can model what he does. Is, it's called active inference. So you yeah. have all of these cybernetic loops, just yeah, like yeah. you're speaking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have um, kind of self-organization and emergence on successive scales. Yeah. And consciousness, according to him, actually emerges at the top of the hierarchy when yeah. there's a certain counterfactual depth of, of planning into the future. But but the, the, the analogy there is is that there's a concentration of information processing and, and in the society, there's a mm. concentration of power right. when you have all of these different cybernetic loops applied at different scales. So to what extent is that just a natural phenomenon? The concentration. The concentration yeah, of power, yeah. yeah. Well, well, you know, I mean, my, my sort of counterfactual would be if it's so flipping natural, why is so much effort put all the time into repressing any other possibilities? Because they are. You know, the, the the very start of our educational system is designed to encourage us to believe that only obedience to the teachers and the headmaster and the school rules are, uh, are acceptable means of being. And there are experiments with, I mean, I know that the term free school has taken on a whole other meaning in the last decade or two. But actually, there was a thing called the free schools where, for example, I mean, they were only social experiments. I'm not trying to scale them or, or sort of even valorize them. All I'm saying is that there are other there are other ways of doing things and there have been experiments with other ways of doing things where, um, you know, I mean, shockingly, students would have to get together in their own general assembly and decide what their curriculum for the week was going to be. And the amazing thing about that is, obviously, it being an experimental school, it was sort of most immediately reached for by people who had kids that were really not fitting in a lot of the time into those kind of more ordered systems that, you know, when the kids had for themselves decided what they they really stuck to it. You know, because mm. they, they decided it for themselves. And and I think um, the possibility of these other possibilities is constantly being eliminated. And it, it, I would, you know, I, 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 I can't even start to conceive of how it's plausible this is the only natural outcome when it's clearly so many unnatural processes going in to sustain it. And the same thing, for example, something that I think we may have discussed offline, I'm not sure, but um, at, at another point is the Lucas plan. You know, the idea that um, of the, you know, the Lucas Arms Company in the 1970s, very similar time, weirdly. You know, we're back in, the, in this massive recession and they were working in an arms company and that was going to restructure. The, the horrible term that we're all so familiar with, you know, that was going to restructure. And so probably a lot of them are going to be put out of work or things are going to get a lot tougher. But anyway, that was also the same time as echoing back to our other stuff, the beginnings of the feminist movement, beginnings of the environmental movement. These all pervaded these workers' own self-discovery uh, where they they set themselves the task of, okay, if we're going to do, if we're going to transform this company to be su sustainable, survivable, what are we going to do? And they generated their own ideas, okay, for actual products, but also for how the production of those products should be organized. It was a, you know, pretty impressive. I have actually looked at the Lucas plan. It's a pretty impressive, comprehensive uh, alternative definition of how a company could be run and i mean what do i know but it looked pretty viable to me but it was com and it stands as an example of potential but it was completely repressed and uh you know re removed as or taken off the board as a possibility so so i'm sorry to i don't want to ramble on it but when i push back to that assumption of naturalization is that i don't see anything natural in the assertion in the singularity of what we currently have Yes, and or natural is another observer relative property, and as you say, yeah, the, yeah. the the lack of imagination is kind of truncated by the the paradigm that that we exist in. Yeah, and and Chomsky spoke to this in in corporations when you have subversive elements. It's not like there's a, a bunch of people smoking a cigar, you know, planning how to take over the world. It's a systemic reaction. It's like a yeah. an immune response. Right. Sub subversive yeah. elements are are eliminated but in a very diffuse and abstract way. So it's very difficult to um, find a locus mm. of, of agency, you know, directing directing that exclusion. Right. And also in the globalized world, 
um, it's very difficult when you get these small um, elements of self-organization that you're speaking to, you're in the context of, of a much bigger paradigm, which will have that immune reaction. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I, I 100% agree. I don't even know whether many, many years ago I must have picked that, maybe picked that off, off Chomsky myself because I've always thought about it as far as I can remember in terms of this kind of immune response. I think partly because I feel I might have experienced that a few times myself anyway. But And again, it is like you say, it's a sort of diffuse thing, um, but still very powerful. And, uh, you know, that's a, a point of, like you say, about sort of naturalization. If you step back and say, well, there's another kind of natural process happening here, which is this this sort of elimination of, of rivalries or of alternatives. In, in any case, I think, look at, it'd be very hard to argue for, well, I think, given the obvious uh, uh, life-threatening array of things happening right now on one level or another, it would be difficult to argue that something else isn't worth a try. Uh, probably many other different things you know we should we should experiment multiply and, yes. and perhaps and that's my hope for technologies you know if there is one that perhaps there are aspects of these computational frameworks which have kind of lurked in and out of our conversation that have something to offer there you know have something to offer um in terms of communication and, and scale of a different kind of you know re of recursive and layered interactive uh, adaptive scale you know, perhaps that there is something to offer there to, to these alternative experiments, but it's the values of those alternative experiments to me that are the most important thing. And the technology, if it is useful, it's great. If it isn't, um, I'm not going to cry about it. I'm more interested in those uh, real these alternative realities at least having a chance to come into being. Amazing. Dr. Dan McQuillan, mm. thank you very much for joining us today. It's mm. been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Mm. Wonderful. Amazing. Um, this is really good. We haven't 